All right. Good afternoon. It is Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. Uh, same as it ever was, we are going to do muscle physiology in a lecture today, and our lab is going to be origins, insertions, and actions. Uh, we have several homework assignments over the next uh, couple weeks. Uh, this Thursday, your unit 10 review is going to be due. Uh, then we have a whole week off, which should give you plenty of time to do all seven of the Physio X exercises. Again, you don't have to do them all in one sitting. You don't have to turn them all in at once. Uh, just make sure that they are all done, all completed, seven lab reports, and those are turned in uh, on Tuesday the 6th. Uh, also next, also on that week, your unit 11 review and your muscle activity handout, which will be graded for correctness. And hopefully you've already started working on that because we have been, uh, as I said, we're gonna start doing those types of things today and taking advantage of that, all leading up to the 13th, which is gonna rapidly approach where we have the lab and lecture exam on this material. Speaking of lab and lecture exams, I apologize for the delay, but your unit three exams are now graded. I will be releasing them for a review after class today, so for about 24 hours, uh, especially for those of you who are doing the Science Success Center. Uh, one of the activities I know you're supposed to do is to evaluate your exams and write about what you did right and what you did wrong and how you can improve and things along those lines. So that is a perfect opportunity to do that. Also, because we're about halfway through the points, uh, um, this is a good point. Yes, Leanna, do you have a question? Are we supposed to, uh, like, how would I send it to my Science Success Center? Would I screenshot everything or would I, is there like a easier way to do that? My understanding is you, you don't have to send it to them. You just are responsible for uh, doing whatever the activity is associated with that. So I think there's just some questions you're supposed to answer. There's a form you're supposed to fill out while you evaluate it yourself. So you don't have to uh, send the exam to them. The point is for you to evaluate the exam, what you did right, what you did wrong. And again, uh, I, I, every Every instructor uh, that is in that has a slightly different uh, way that they evaluate that, but I think pretty sure there's a form that you fill out. So I would talk to your, uh, your Science Success Center uh, instructor and they'll tell you what is necessary for that. But you know, it shouldn't be necessary to do that. Oh yeah, you're right. I forgot that's what, that was the assignment. Thank you. Yep, no worries. Uh, the other thing that I want to have available for you guys this week going into spring break, because again, I know spring break, it has been exhausting. It has been fast paced and the uh, inclination is to want to take a break. And certainly you should take a break during spring break, take at least a good 15, 20 minute break. Uh, but then you also should be using this time uh, to help you to prepare for the last stretch of this class. And one of the things that I want to do to help you to do that is to meet with you again, just like we met at the beginning of class uh, for uh, five minutes for to talk about your exams, to talk about where you are in the class, what your goals are for the class moving forward, what's possible, what's not possible, and to have those types of discussions and to encourage you to meet with me this week. Uh, I, have, I will give you five points for meeting with me for five minutes to discuss uh, where you are in the class right now. I think this is particularly important for those people who are not passing the class right now. Uh, so I saw something in the text, I may have misspoke in the last one uh, and said this is available for C students as well. But really the point is for those students who aren't passing right now uh, to really to, uh, to dangle that carrot, to really encourage you to come and meet with me so we can talk about why you're struggling. And uh, hopefully while there's still time to get you up to a pass in grade, we can talk about that. Uh, those appointments are available right now on Confer Zoom. Uh, luckily, I have a class, I have an exam in my 431 class tomorrow. So basically, it's a morning class, but that whole chunk of time, I'm going to be on the computer trying to help students if they're having any difficulty or problems that way anyway. So it's a perfect opportunity. So there's a big chunk of time there. I have made some time after class today. And then also there's a couple appointments on both Thursday before our class and Friday, even in the late morning. Uh, so hopefully uh, those times are something that will accommodate people. Uh, basically go to the appointments and confer Zoom, uh, select my name as the person you want to make an appointment with and you should be able to see all those appointments and I've seen that already uh, many of them are starting to fill up. So I do want to encourage you to take advantage of that as well. All right, questions on any of that? All right, excellent. Hopefully that means that everybody is understanding and not that everybody is already asleep. All right, we left off last class and we had pretty much been focusing on here. We were talking about the process of how we produce a muscle uh, contraction. 
and all of the processes involved with that. And we, while it is a long continuous process, uh, we have divided it up into three more easily digestible pieces. And that is where we left off last time. So let's actually go back to our whiteboard actually from here and do some writing. So let's go ahead and clear all of that. When we're talking about our muscle contraction. And this doesn't need to be green. All right. Uh, we took this process of muscle contraction and divided it into three more easily digestible steps. What is the first step again? Someone remind me of what that first step is. Communication at the neuromuscular junction. Excellent. When we're talking about these steps, it's always important to think about what the goal of the step is. And what is the goal of our communication at the neuromuscular junction? To convert the neural action potential into muscle action potential. Excellent. And while I won't go through all of the steps involved with it, it is probably worthwhile to remind ourselves what was the very first step, the very first step in this first stage it was the very first thing we had to do. Thought. Yeah, make the decision, exactly. We had to have that thought, make that decision that we were going to uh, contract the muscle. And what was the very last step? in this process. What was the very last thing that happened at the end when we were describing it? The action potential reaches the muscle. Okay, well, it wasn't so much that the action potential reached the muscle, but you have the right idea. What did the muscle do? Contract. Contract. No, we didn't contract. That's not the end of communication at the neuromuscular junction. What was the very last step of what we described in the process of communication at the neuromuscular junction? There we go. I like that. Excellent. We generated a muscle action potential. And that muscle action, uh, well, let's be more, even more specific. At the motor end plate. and the muscle action potential, which I'm gonna abbreviate now because I wrote it out once, spreads down the sarcolemma. Excellent. Perfect, perfect, perfect. That is a good con uh, condensing of the information that we talked about in the last class involving communication at the neuromuscular junction. So that is, of course, going to lead us today into step two. What is the second phase of this muscle contraction process called? Excitation contraction coupling. Excellent, excitation contraction coupling. And of course, it's always good to think in terms of the goal because it helps us to understand what it is that we need to do. What was the goal of excitation contraction coupling? To move the regulatory proteins. Excellent. What are we going to use to move those regulatory proteins? Calcium. Excellent. Absolutely. So our goal here is to use calcium. Oops. Move our regulatory proteins. Excellent. And we also know where this process is going to start. What is the start? What is the very first step of excitation contraction coupling? Muscle action potential. Exactly, right? Remember, because this is a continuous process that we are artificially dividing into three pieces, the end of step one is also gonna be the beginning of step two. 
So the exact same thing we wrote for the very end of communication at the neuromuscular junction is the exact same thing we are going to write for the start of excitation contracture coupling. We generated a, and I'm just going to go ahead and abbreviate it because I wrote it at the top over here. Although actually I'm going to get rid of it. So I'll go ahead and write this out. Perfect. Now, obviously, we haven't talked about the process yet, so we don't know where it ends. But these three pieces of information we absolutely positively do have and do know. And let's go ahead and write end here so that we can fill it in when we get to that point. All right. So again, our goal is to understand this big, long process of a muscle contraction. We already learned everything we wanted to know and more about communication at the neuromuscular junction in the last class. So we've done that. But what's relevant for us today is where it ended. It ended when we generated that muscle action potential at the motor end plate and that muscle action potential spread down the sarcolemma. So that is where we can pick up with step two, excitation contraction coupling. So let's go ahead and move this up to the top. And just like we did last time, we are going to need to begin this process by first making sure we understand and remember the anatomy <coughs> involved. We, of course, know that this starts. No. on the sarcolemma, and so we'll make this my sarcolemma. And of course, on that sarcolemma, we know we have that invaginated motor end plate. We already know all the anatomy of everything that goes along with that. We have our synaptic M bulb. We have our synaptic cleft. We have all the things that are going on over here that we talked about in step one. And we need to see it and where it is and what it does. But again, we're not going to discuss it in this part because that was part of step one. But what we do need to talk about is what is going on with the rest of our uh, muscle anatomy here. We have this skeletal muscle cell. And as we know, we have this special sarcolemma. I'm going to need to make this smaller, aren't I? <coughs> Excuse me. But we also know that there is an invagination of the sarcolemma that penetrates down deep into the muscle cell, all the way to the center of the muscle cell. I don't like that one. And what is that invagination of the sarcolemma called again? T-tubule. T -t well, but remember, we don't want to call it T-tubule right off the bat. We want to say what the T stands for. And I think I heard someone say it right at the beginning. It's the transverse tubule. But you are correct. And again, this remember, obviously, you're not going to be drawing these things on the exam. Uh, on the, if we were taking this in the classroom, it'd be much easier to do, but obviously drawing isn't something you're going to be able to do. So one of the important things to remember while you're writing out these uh, answers on the exam is you can do it one of two ways. You can do it like I did up there in the start where you write something out once and then abbreviate it after that. But the other thing you want, if you wanna have it either at the very top or the very bottom of your, uh, of your exam question, you wanna have a key where you say T tubule means, you know, equals transverse tubule and, you know, uh, MAP equals um, muscle action potential or whatever. If you want to have a key at the bottom or at the top and then use abbreviations all the time, that's fine. Or if you just want to write it out once and abbreviate it, that's fine as well. You just, for these essay questions, you have to have it written out once in one location. Then after that, uh, on that essay question, then that is fine. <coughs> I tickled my throat for some reason now. All right, excellent. So we have this transverse tubule that we know penetrates deep into the muscle cell. I'm only drawing it partially of the way down uh, because it suits my needs to be able to do that. 
We also know that associated with this transverse tubule is a big, huge, massive enlargement of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So here we have our sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what do we call the big, huge enlargement of it again? Is it the something triad? Well, it's, you are correct. This is going to be part of a triad, but this is the second component of the triad. So one of the components of the triad is the transverse tubules. What is this second component of the triad, this enlarged region of the sarcoplasmic reticulum? The sternum? Terminal or something? There you go. Terminal cistern or cisternae. Cisterna, singular. Excellent. And as you have uh, so poignantly pointed out, we also know that there is another terminal cistern on the other side. So I can go ahead and abbreviate this TC for that one there. And we know that this is also the sarcoplasmic reticulum and I can go ahead and abbreviate that there. And it's on the other side as well. And as you have so clearly pointed out, these three things together, the two terminal cisternae and the transverse tubule collectively are what we call the triad. Excellent. What did we say the sarcoplasmic reticulum does? Stores the calcium. Yeah, stores calcium. Excellent. And so obviously it is vitally important that this uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum take the calcium out of the cell because it makes cells do wonky things. So not surprisingly, there are gonna be a large number of our friends, those calcium pumps that as we know, use ATP. And they use that ATP to move uh, calcium out of the cytosol and into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Yes, Yulia. So um, if most of our calcium is stored in the bones, does, does it get it from the bone right next to the muscle or from the blood? It gets it from the blood. Okay. And again, remember, you are right. The vast majority of our calcium is indeed stored in our bones. Remember here in our sarcoplasmic reticulum, we said we had the second highest concentration of calcium in the body. So there is massive amounts of uh, calcium that is indeed stored inside the sarcoplasmic reticulums of our um, muscle cells. Okay. All right, questions on that. All right, we need a way to get calcium out of this sarcoplasmic reticulum. And luckily we have already learned of a way to do that. And that way that we're gonna do that is our voltage gated calcium channels. These are gated channels, meaning they can be opened and closed. And what is the key to unlocking these channels? To release calcium. Well, calcium, you're right, is what is gonna pass through the channels. So calcium is what A goes signal? through the door, but how do we unlock the door? A signal from the brain. Okay, but in this particular case, how do we unlock the door? What is gonna cause the change that is gonna cause this door to unlock? A threshold? Action. Yeah, a voltage Threshold. change. Exactly. We, a voltage change. We know the cell's resting membrane potential. Is about negative 70 millivolts. And you are correct. If we can depolarize the cell, make the cell more positive, and reach that magical point that we call threshold, then this channel will open. All right, now 
The other thing we know is that this transverse tubule and the sarcoplasmic reticulum wraps around our myofibril. Our myofibril, remember, is our contractile organelle. And it is made up of a bunch of sarcomeres. So what we'll do is cheat a little bit here. I will draw a portion of a sarcomere coming this way. Uh, so again, to remind us that this is the sarcomere, but actually over here, I'll actually draw a sarcomere. And as we know, that sarcomere starts with a Z-disc. Coming off of that Z-disc, we have an actin filament. Uh, we know that it is also associated with a myosin or our thick filament, which, as we know, has all of those heads coming off of it. And what we're caring about right now is that we know sitting over the top or really between these two things, we have our big long thread-like uh, protein that is our tropomyosin. Excuse me. And that tropomyosin has these handle-like proteins on it that are the troponin. And those two are our regulatory proteins. All right, questions on this? Again, really no new information here. We're just reminding us of the anatomy and the components that we have already talked about and identified. And I just wanna make sure that we understand the parts that we've talked about that are gonna play a role in this process. I have a quick question. Yes. So these um, these triads, are, are we, is this the first layer? Is this the white stri striation of a muscle or is it all throughout? all muscle cells? A oh, great question. So it, it, it isn't associated with the stripes. And actually, let's cheat and go back to the picture from your textbook. Notice if we look at the picture in the textbook, what we see here is that, again, remember the parts that contain the myosin. So from here to here, all of that is our A band, the dark band. Right, And then all of the part uh, that doesn't have myosin is our light band. So we have a dark band and a light band and a dark band and a light band, and they go the entire length of the muscle cell. Those bands are based on the arrangement of proteins in the myofibrils. The uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, its transverse tubule, and this is the terminal cisternae of the rough endoplasmic, or I mean the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, wrap around the myofibrils. So they're not a part of the myofibrils and they're not a part of the stripes. So to clarify, we're talking about a singular muscle cell that will have the T tubules throughout it, but it doesn't tell us anything about the dark versus light striations that we see on, on muscles under microscope. Correct. The triad is the, these three structures, 
the two uh, terminal cisternae and the transverse tubule that wrap around all of these individual organelles that are the myofibrils. Yes, everything we've been talking about so far is inside of a single muscle cell. But you have to remember a single muscle cell is going to have somewhere between hundreds and thousands of myofibrils inside of it. Right? And so these sarcoplasmic reticulum, this transverse tubule wraps around them. So it is the proteins of the myofibrils that make the stripes. And then these are just wrapping around those myofibrils, helping the myofibrils to do their job. All right. Thank you. Could you also go back to the slide where you, you, that you drew for us? Yeah, I'm gonna go back there in a minute, but I just wanted us to see this picture first again before we do that. So notice in my illustration here, I have just drawn a small portion of a triad, just the very smallest part of a myofibrial, but enough for us to see what is going to happen and what is going to go on here. All right. I have another quick question too. Yes, of course. So um, would depending on how much we use that muscle have more or less of the triad T-tubule things or not necessarily? Are they evenly dispersed throughout all different kinds of muscles? Uh, so when you use a muscle, you are going to make more proteins and add to more proteins to the myofibrils that are in there. Uh, but that isn't going to significantly change the amount of sarcoplasmic reticulum or transverse tubules that you have. It's much easier to add and subtract proteins to the myofibril than it would be to add more sarcoplasmic reticulum or certainly to add more transverse tubules. If you think about it, it'd be very hard to get new big deep invaginations of the plasma membrane to form as a result of this. So typically, and again, if we go back to this picture here, uh, when we use our muscle a lot, when we work out, what would happen is this myofibril would make more proteins and it would get bigger, right? But the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the transverse tubule is still going to wrap around it. All right. Questions on that? Sorry, I haven't caffeinated enough today. It's, it's on me. I apologize for that. <laughs> I will caffeinate during the first break, and uh, hopefully that will help. All righty. So, and I appreciate these questions, because as I've said before, we're layering all these things on top of other things. So if it's not making sense now, it's just gonna get worse if we keep adding to it. So I wanna make sure we understand this before we go any further. Could you briefly go back to the slide you drew? Thank you. Yeah, well, this is where we're gonna add. So I wanna be here, all right. Uh, probably has to get a little larger to continue to wrap around the, uh, the myofibril as the myofibril gets bigger. But I mean, again, it's not the, it's not where you see much more growth is in the uh, is in the myofibril itself. All right. Any other anatomy questions? Okay, so I'm I'm sorry, but I forgot what exactly does tropomycin do? And I see little black blocks that are troponin. Could you remind me, please? Yes, remember uh, our actin filament is, I, which I've drawn as just a line, if you remember correctly, is really a dimer made up of two proteins. And on those two proteins, there is a binding site where the head of a myosin wants to grab on. So that myosin head wants to grab to the actin so it can perform its activity and it can produce the tension and it can make the muscle contract. And myosin wants to grab onto actin all the time. What troponin and tropomyosin do as the regulatory proteins are block that. Again, I have to work on my analogies because all of my analogies are based on us sitting in the classroom at American River College. And if you've ever been at Two American River College, uh, you know that just down the street from it is a McDonald's. 
And if you're in the drive through from the McDonald's, you will actually see that there is a ladder on the outside of the McDonald's, which you could use to get onto the roof of the McDonald's. Has anybody here ever seen that before? Remember that vaguely? Yeah. Okay, excellent, a couple of you have. How many of you actually climbed that ladder onto the roof of the McDonald's? Anyone? No. no. Why not? Because it was either half of a ladder or something was blocking the bottom part. Exactly, what it is is actually someone is blocking uh, the bottom part. Right, yeah, exactly, you go to Zoom Community College. If you actually go there and look, what you'll see is there's basically this big, huge sheet of plexiglass that is sitting over the top of the ladder rungs. And because that big, huge sheet of plexiglass is over the top of the, of the rungs of the ladder, you can't grab onto the rungs of the ladder and you can't climb that ladder. However, and again, I haven't looked at it that closely, but I'm assuming there's a lock and if you unlock that lock, it would allow you to pivot the plexiglass out of the way. You'd be able to grab onto the rungs and you'd be able to climb up to the top of the ladder. And that's exactly what the troponin and the tropomyosin do. The tropomyosin is the plexiglass that blocks myosin from grabbing onto the handrail. Uh, and troponin is the protein that will allow us to move it and rotate it out of the way. And once it's rotated out of the way, then myosin and actin can interact. Yeah, but what would our mascot be? We would need a mascot if we're gonna be the Zoom Community College. Right. It could be the COVID molecule. <laughs> there you go. Or a gift or something like that, GIF. Excellent, all right. Excellent, so any other questions on the anatomy of this? Sorry, it's me again. So yeah. actin filaments have the dimer in its, what was its name? It the dimer. It. So again, if you, if you think back here, hold on. Sorry, I have so many questions today. That's all right. That's like I said, I wanna make sure that we understand that if you don't like my drawings and you go way back to our first lecture Here's a good place to see it. So here's what it looks like. Here in yellow are the dimers that are the actin and the little black spots on them or where myosin is able to grab onto and pull. But notice we have this long thread-like protein called tropomyosin that is blocking the active sites, blocking the binding sites so the myosin cannot grab it. Okay, thank you so much. And yeah. then there- so What we want to do is move them out of the way. And so when it's time to move them out of the way, that's what troponin is gonna do for us. Yes, go ahead, what were you saying? Um, so the actin, wants to grab onto myosin's what part? Oh. Myosin wants to grab onto the active site of the, oops, too far. Actin, myosin wants to grab onto the binding site or active site of the actin. Okay. It's Thank like you. you climbing a ladder. Your hand wants to grab onto the rung of the ladder so you can pull yourself up. And that's exactly what myosin does. Myosin wants to grab onto the actin and pull on the actin. Okay, okay. I am, I'm getting it. Thank you so much. Yep, excellent. All right. Like I said, if this, if this isn't making sense, then it's just gonna get worse. So I appreciate that doing this to take the time to make sure it makes sense. So any other questions on the anatomy before we see how it works? All right, excellent. And then in that case, just like we did last time, let's start first with initiation. Oops, hold on. Make it a little bit bigger. Initiation of excitation contraction coupling. Now, we already know that this begins where we produce the muscle action potential at the motor end plate. And I've written that out three times already, so I'm not gonna read it out again because it's written out right above us. 
and it spreads down the sarcolemma. Now, we know that that action potential that is being produced, because we've already talked about it a couple times, is a big, huge positive signal. So we have this big, huge positive signal that is spreading down the sarcolemma. Um, Uh, the length of the sarcomeres are essentially universal. Yep. All right, that's how we get such precise stripes. If they all changed, you wouldn't get precise stripes in the same way. So it's a big positive signal. And of course, as a big positive signal spreads, it makes the cell more positive. And what was the big fancy word that we said for making a cell more positive? Something to do with polar. Yeah, Thanks exactly. Polarity. Something to do with polar. Not just polarization, Depolarize. but a depolarization. Depolarize. So as it's spreading, it depolarizes the cell, depolarizes the sarcolemma. Now notice there are these big invaginations, these transverse tubules. So that same muscle action potential that spreads down the sarcolemma is able to spread down the transverse tubule. So our muscle action potential spreads down the T-tubule, which just happens to be right next to our terminal cisternae. And so this causes our triad to depolarize. Let's say it this way, triad depolarizes. There you go, excellent. And I may need to make that a teeny bit smaller so it fits. There we go. Our triad depolarizes, gets more positive, which is convenient because there are a bunch of voltage gated channels on our terminal cisternae and on our sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember as we talked about, a um, action potential is about a 100 millivolt change. And while a resting membrane potential is negative 70, what did we say the typical threshold for a voltage gated channel was? Was it 65? Negative 60 millivolts, exactly. And it does honestly vary a little bit, but the number we'll use in my class is negative 60. So we only need a 10 millivolt change is that big, huge, massive wave of the muscle action potential gonna be able to cause a 10 millivolt change? Absolutely. And so what happens is our voltage gated calcium channels reach threshold. And as we talked about last time, what is the immediate effect of these voltage gated channels reaching threshold? They open up. Exactly, our voltage gated Calcium channels open. And what's the immediate effect of these voltage gated calcium channels opening? Calcium rushes in and well, attaches to. Well, so let's not jump ahead, but you have the right idea. And let's think in terms of directions. In this case, calcium actually leaves the sarcoplasmic reticulum and goes into the cytosol. However, remember. As we mentioned, our cytosol of our muscle cell has a fancy name. We call it the sarcosol. So it goes into the cytosol. Let's just go ahead and use cytosol. It's better. Right. Into the cytosol. Right. It's like we talked about before. All those prisoners are locked up in jail in Folsom. And so it's plenty fine to live in Folsom. You're perfectly safe because all of those bad guys are locked up in the jail. All of our calcium is locked up here in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So everything is fine. However, when these voltage gated calcium channels open, then it's jailbreak time. And we have a massive release of calcium out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. 
Now, we have these pumps that are going to try to that are going to try to move the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But if I have 10 doors open and only one pump moving them in, am I going to be able to get all the calcium that comes out back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum? No. No. So we are going to see an increase in the concentration of calcium in the cytosol. Uh, the pumps will, they try to bring calcium back into the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic. Okay. Yeah, to lock it back up. Right. In fact, one of the ways we're able to store so much calcium inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a special protein. That special protein is called cal sequestrin. Right. Sequester means to lock away. Right. They talk about that with juries sometimes in very high profile cases. They will sequester the jury so that they can't read the newspapers or see the news or talk to other people or things along those lines. Well, cal sequestrin sequesters calcium. So there's actually a special protein in here that allows us to lock a massive amount of protein into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the pumps are going to try to get it back in there, but with all those gates open, there's going to be a massive amount of calcium coming out. And so we're going to get an increase in the concentration of calcium in the cytosol. I have teenage girls. Of course, I know about the Grinwin world. Excellent. Now, remember also that this sarcoplasmic reticulum, and again, my drawing doesn't do uh, justice, but we know it is wrapped around the myofibril. So when all that calcium is released, and let's cheat and make this bigger, when all that calcium is released into the cytosol, it's sitting right on top of our sarcomere. And what's going to happen is the calcium is going to bind to our troponin. And when calcium binds to troponin, troponin undergoes a conformational change, which again, is one of those really, really fun, fancy phrases uh, that you can say to impress your friends and family, that troponin undergoes a conformational change. But someone remind me again what that really just means. Yeah, all it means is that it changes its shape. And when it changes its shape, basically as it changes its shape, it turns and it rotates. And since it's connected to the tropomycin, when it turns and rotates, it rotates or moves the tropomycin. And when it moves that tropomycin, so let's think about this. So in this case, this is gonna rotate, nope, don't want that to be that big now. This is gonna rotate up and there and there. And I can actually cheat in this case, since it's not actually drawn on the board. I can actually grab it and move it out of the way. So when that, when that calcium binds to the troponin, and let's put one there. There, it rotates the tropomycin out of the way. And now that the tropomycin is out of the way, the active site, or again, uh, oops, we can call it the active site, or we can call it the myosin binding site. Both of those, again, acceptable terms. on the actin is exposed. And when the active site, 
let's do it this way. Hold on. Slash mice and binding site on the actin is exposed. And this allows our myosin head to grab the actin. Start the contractile cycle. And that was our goal. Our goal was to be able to move our regulatory proteins so that our myosin could bind on to our actin. Come on, I want to grab that, put that there now, and move that there now. And there you go. Notice step two is not quite as elaborate as step one, but still equally important. Questions on that? Again, it's all in a name. The name of this step is the excitation contraction coupling. We are going from the excitation, the production of the muscle action potential, to the contraction, the generation of tension, which is going to occur from myosin grabbing onto the actin. And how did we accomplish that coupling? By using calcium to move the regulatory proteins out of the way. And there you go. Initiation of excitation contraction coupling. I'll ask again, questions on this. No. So remember, the step one is where we produce the muscle action potential. Noticing here, we're not producing the muscle action potential. That happened at the communication at the neuromuscular junction. What we're doing here is using that electrical signal to open calcium channels. So the electrical signal has already been produced, right? So we are using that electrical signal to open our calcium channels, to let calcium into the cytosol, so that we can move those regulatory proteins out of the way. Notice we are not making the action potential. We are not generating the tension. We are just linking those two things together. And that's, it's in the name, excitation contraction coupling. We're not making the excitation. We're not making the contraction. We are linking the two of them together. And the way we do that is by using the electrical signal to move the regulatory proteins so that the contraction can occur. All right, well, I'm glad to hear that, excellent. Well, that's why we have lots of different modalities for learning this material. All righty. One last call, questions on initiation. Because remember, as we talked about before, while we need to be able to turn these things on, we also need to be able to turn these things off as well. So let's make sure we understand this and then we can uh, tackle our second essay question, potential essay question on this material, termination of excitation contraction coupling. Okay, just to clarify once again, it's the second step is to use the, uh, to open up the calcium channels to allow the regulatory proteins to move out of the sarcolemma? Oh, the sarcomere. Yeah, so calcium, so remember, sarcolemma is the plasma membrane. So the action potential is produced on the plasma membrane, spreads on the plasma membrane, opens the calcium channels, right? Depolarizes the triad, which opens the voltage-gated calcium channels, allowing calcium to leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. And once that calcium is in the cytosol, it can bind to the troponin, cause the troponin to change its shape. And when it changes its shape, it rotates uh, the tropomyosin out of the way. Again, uh, I think uh, 
uh, Maximilian pointed out, there are great animations in your uh, modified master name P that are great for that. Those are really excellent. The pictures from your textbook are pretty good as well. Notice if we go to the pictures from your textbook, we can see these processes as well. Notice here we see the muscle action potential traveling down the sarcolemma, traveling down the transverse tubule. Notice here's our transverse tubule. Here's our terminal cisternae and the rest of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And we can see how it's wrapped around uh, that myofibril. Depolarizing the triad. And again, when it depolarizes that triad, it opens our voltage gated calcium channels and calcium is released into the cytosol, out of the jail, into the cytosol, free to move around inside the cell. And here's this great picture again from your textbook. Notice when the muscle is at rest, our myosin is trying to grab onto the actin, but that pesky tropomyosin is in the way. However, in the presence of calcium, Calcium binds to the troponin. The troponin undergoes that change of shape. It undergoes a conformational change. And when that happens, it rotates. And when it rotates, it pulls that tropomyosin. And now the plexiglass is out of the way and you can climb to the roof of the McDonald's. The handholds are open. Our myosin binding site, that active site is open. And now myosin can grab the actin and we can start the contraction. There's a couple more animations. These don't come from your textbook, but I like them. So I think it's worthwhile to show them because again, the more ways you have to understand this material, the better. Here we see the same thing, generating the muscle action potential. Here, let's actually do it this way. It spreads down the transverse tubule depolarizes the sarcoplasmic reticulum, releases calcium, which moves the regulatory protein and allows the myosin to bind to the actin. However, my favorite picture is actually this one. Notice for all of these, we've been looking at our myofibril longitudinally, but notice here, we're looking at it from a cross view. With this cross view, here is our thick filament of the myosin with its myosin head wanting to grab onto the actin. But that gosh darn tropomyosin is in the way. And there's our handle, the troponin. Notice when calcium is released, it binds to the troponin and the troponin changes its shape. And when it changes its shape, it rotates the tropomyosin out of the way. Once the tropomyosin is out of the way, that active site, that myosin binding site is now open and our myosin head can grab onto the actin and start the contraction. So I think this one really does a nice job of showing how it's gonna rotate out. And if you also remember, although I don't think, and again, yet another pretty picture, lots of pictures that show all of this. I talked about the cal sequestrant already that keeps all the calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, the one last thing I want to remind you about for this, let's go back. Module. Muscle classroom models. Excellent. This is what I want. Well, we can actually go through all of this. Let's do that. Because it's good to beat horses till they're dead and beyond. Again, here we saw these models of a single muscle cell where again, we are looking at in orange on this one, the transverse tubule, white is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And here we see the triad with the terminal cisternae sitting over the top of and wrapping around our myofibrils. 
We see that from a couple of views. Notice this model does the same thing. Again, in this case, blue is the transverse tubules, the folds in of the sarcolemma. Here in beige is our sarcoplasmic reticulum with the thickened terminal cisternae forming our triad. And again, it wraps around our myofibril. But the model that I really wanted to remind you about was this sarcomere model. Notice, remember, this sarcomere model is a model of a single sarcomere, but it actually has this plastic sheet that sits over the top that is actually supposed to represent our transverse tubule here in yellow, our sarcoplasmic reticulum here in green. So this thickened part would be the terminal cisternae. So we would have two terminal cisternae for a triad wrapping around a single myofibril or a single sarcomere in this case. And notice there we see a couple of them that way. And when we remove it again, notice here on top of our wrapping around our actin connected to the Z disc in yellow is our trochomyosin. And then the green little handles are the troponin. Those are those regulatory proteins. Do I have a closer up view? Yeah, there we go, that one's a little bit closer. Yeah, that's it. Uh, where again, the yellow is the tropomyosin, the green is the troponin, that will move this out of the way. And yes, the animations online are excellent as well. All right, questions? Question. Yes, go ahead. So uh, when we voluntarily contract our muscle, for example, uh, when we do that plank position exercise, yep. Uh, do we uh, get stuck in this second stage? Like, uh, uh, how does that so, work? And some great, people can wait for it's a, a great question that you're answering, asking, but you have to remember what we're looking at right now. When you are planking, heck, when I am picking up this pen, as light as this pen is for me to lift up and move through space, am I just using one single muscle cell to lift this up in space? No. No, I've got to put a lot of muscle cells together to do that work. So I promise you we are going to build to that point when we can talk about those types of sustained contractions and how they work and all the things that go along with that. But we're not there yet. We are still here inside of a single muscle cell, just looking at what's happening with all of the proteins inside of this single muscle cell. Once we understand what's happening in this single muscle, on the single sarcomere, on these single proteins, then once we fully understand that, then we can start building up to understand how I move this pen through space, how you hold yourself in a planking position, how we do all of those things. We will build to that, but we have to understand these basics first. Okay, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Excellent. All right. Awesome questions. You guys are great today. I love this. This is awesome. All right. So last call. Any more questions on initiation before we switch gears to termination? All right. So then our goal here is to identify our second possible essay question. And that second possible essay question will be termination of excitation contraction coupling. And just like we saw before, where uh, communication at the neuromuscular junction ends is where excitation contraction coupling begins. And if you remember when we terminated communication at the neuromuscular junction, we stopped producing muscle action potentials. And so there were no new positive signals spreading down the sarcolemma. So that is not only the end of termination of communication at the muscular junction, but it is also uh, the beginning of termination of excitation contraction coupling. So, as we said, no new muscle action potentials. 
there's nothing to keep the cell positive. And if the cell can't stay positive anymore, it wants to go back to rest. And what did we call that process of the cell going back to its resting membrane potential? Um, is it relaxing? Close. It was started with re, but it was repolarization. Repolarizes, absolutely. So our sarcolemma repolarizes. Excellent. Oops, and now let's make this smaller again. So new, no new muscle action potentials, our sarcolemma repolarizes. That means our transverse tubule repolarizes. And if our transverse tubule repolarizes, that means our triad repolarizes. And if our triad repolarizes, what happens to our voltage gated calcium channels? They close. Excellent. And if they close, that means no new calcium into the cytosol. So our Voltage gated calcium channels close. There is no new calcium being released into the cytosol. However, there is still a lot of calcium in the cytosol. So how do we get rid of the calcium that is already in the cytosol? Is it the little Pac-Man thing Oops. like the other one? Well, in this case, no, we're not going to break them down like the same way we did with the neurotransmitter. But remember, we have those calcium pumps. Remember, they weren't able to do much before when our jailbreak of calcium was going on. But now that those calcium channels are closed, our calcium pumps can are able to, so let's do it this way, using our calcium pumps. So we can get rid of the calcium. Now those calcium pumps, again, the calcium pumps were working all along, but now that those channels are closed, now they're finally able to do some damage and those calcium pumps are gonna be able to take that calcium and move it back into and sequester it into our sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so what happens is we get a decrease in calcium in the cytosol. Of course, if there's no calcium in the cytosol, then that means, and let's cheat, I'm gonna take this and move it down there. With no calcium, troponin is going to go back to its original shape. And when troponin goes back to its original shape, what is it going to do? Block the binding sites. Yeah, it's going to rotate tropomyosin back in the way again. Uh, Ariana, to answer your question, repolarization means to go back to the resting membrane potential. So we depolarized it, we made it more positive, but then it goes back to negative 70, back to its resting membrane potential, and that drops it below threshold. So that's why the channels close. Excellent. Troponin goes back to its original shape. When it goes back to its original shape, it rotates the tropomyosin back over the active site on the actin. So let's do that with no calcium, our tropomyosin is gonna be rotated by our troponin back over the site. No, oh, you can stay up there. You can stay up there too. Uh, 
tropomyosin. There's a troponin. Excellent. Rotates the tropomyosin back over the active side of the actin. And now that it's rotated back over the, the active side of the actin, myosin can no oops, longer grab onto actin. And once myosin can no longer grab onto actin, excitation contraction coupling has stopped. And there you go. We have both initiated and terminated excitation contraction coupling. Questions on that? This is kind of random, but what about like a muscle spasm? Would that be caused by like that uh, tropomyosin opening and closing really fast or not related to this process? So it's it would be related to this process in a couple ways. Uh, typically when you have a muscle spasm, you've got the right idea. What would happen is, uh, again, a muscle spasm is basically just an involuntary, uncontrolled, typically uncoordinated uh, contraction of the muscle. Uh, and there are a couple of things, that, there are multiple things that can cause it, but there are two primary causes. One of those primary causes is that, I saw your hand, Laura, just give me a second and I'll answer your question in a second. One of those can be an inappropriate firing of the action potential. If your neuron is irritated or something else causes it to inappropriately release acetylcholine, then that will trigger all these events to occur. Oh, okay, all these events to occur and the muscle will contract inappropriately. Ionic balances can also cause a problem. If some type of ionic balance causes the muscle cell to go above threshold, then its voltage-gated calcium channels are gonna open, calcium's gonna rush out, and that muscle's gonna contract even though you didn't think, hey, muscle, you should contract right now. So while there can be many causes, ionic imbalances and inappropriate neural activity are the two most common. Cool, that totally makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. All right. Well, but you also have to remember uh, your uterus is smooth muscle. Uh, not skeletal muscles. So that the, the contractions of the uh, uterus that uh, cause the expulsion of the baby are outside of your conscious control and are primarily controlled by hormones, yes. Laura, did you have a second question? Um, yeah, just to like kind of piggyback off of those first two questions. So for like the tremors and the twitching on Parkinson's or other types of diseases like that, is it involved this or does it um, kind of work around this as well? It does. And that primarily, uh, especially Parkinson's, Parkinson's basically comes uh, from an inappropriate activation of these muscle cells when the body's at rest. So one of the conditions of Parkinson's is at rest, you get this kind of resting tremor. And the reason for that is actually an, uh, associated with an imbalance of neurotransmitters in your central nervous system that cause that that inappropriate firing and that, that, that resting tremor that occurs because uh, that at rest that is, that is so strongly associated with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So yeah. All right. And we'll actually talk about that a little bit when we get to the nervous system in the next session and talk about the central nervous system. We will talk a little bit about Parkinson's a couple times. Also, um, how about like dead people? Like, uh, like, when they, <laughs> like when they die and they like harden up or whatever? Great question. So let's think about that, right? One of the things that we know that happens is we have these calcium pumps whose job it is to move uh, the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, calcium really, really, really wants to get into a muscle cell. There's a lot of it outside, very little of it in the cytosol. So whether it's calcium from coming outside of the cell, let's go ahead and we'll use uh, color how we use, we'll use purple for this. Calcium coming into the cell or calcium coming out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we have pumps that are gonna kick it back out. We have pumps that are gonna stick it into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and they are going to keep that there. 
The problem is those pumps need ATP. And when you die, what do you stop producing? ATP. ATP. So notice if there's no ATP present, then what can happen is calcium can actually start to sneak into the cytosol. It can sneak in from outside, it can sneak out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it can move those regulatory proteins. And when it moves those regulatory proteins, it can cause the muscle to twitch or contract as a result of that. So yeah, so with, with, with cadavers, you see two things that happens. One thing that you see that happens is there can be some twitching, there can be some movements that occur. But then also after a, bed has been a body has been dead for a period of time and a lot of calcium is in, the, is in there, uh, what ends up happening to the body? Rigor mortis. Or... Rigor mortis, right? Whatever position you were in when you died, your muscles are locked into that position. And the reason they're locked into that position is because calcium has been released, causing the myosin to grab the actin and pull. But as we'll see, without ATP, it can't let go. So basically, your muscle locks up into that position of rigor mortis. So absolutely, rigor mortis is absolutely caused by this peskiness of calcium getting out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the uh, cytosol. Yes, Sydney? This might be a little off topic, um, but what is it about troponin when somebody's like having a heart attack and they measure your troponin levels? Why does that happen? Great question. Uh, that is actually a different type of troponin. It is a great okay. question. Cardiac muscle has a protein inside of it called troponin as well. It is a different type of troponin though. And so what happens when cardiac muscle gets damaged, those damaged cells will actually leak some of that troponin into the blood. And so that's what they're looking for with a heart attack is the presence of that specific troponin from the uh, heart muscle. Okay. <laughs> Excellent, yep, absolutely. All right, Excellent. So now we have two possible essay questions. Remember, we've been talking about how a third possible essay question we could talk about is modification. We will actually talk about modification in this part of the excitation contraction coupling, but it really relates more to muscle fatigue. We'll talk once we understand and start building back up to muscle uh, fatigue. Well, first of all, let's let's define muscle fatigue. What do I mean when I say muscle fatigue? Like the muscle gets tired, it doesn't contract as well, I guess. I like that. Doesn't contract as well. It isn't failure of the muscle. And I think that's one of the confusing things that people have. Uh, my favorite example of this, and it's right around the corner now, is baseball. You know, one of the things you see nowadays is every other pitcher is capable of throwing the ball 100 miles an hour, all right? It used to be there was one or two pitchers. Now there are dozens of them. So that pitcher comes out, starts the game, and he's throwing the ball 100 miles an hour. By the fifth inning, he's only throwing the ball 95 miles an hour. Now, being able to throw a ball 95 miles an hour is still pretty damn impressive. However, is that muscle performing at the level that it was capable of before? No. No. So technically he is fatigued, right? So fatigue means that the muscle is not performing at the level that is expected or that it can. It doesn't mean failure, All right? We will talk about the types of things that cause fatigue. But one of the things that causes fatigue, and we'll see how this works, and we'll talk about it right now, is when our muscles are used a lot, one of the things that happens is there are a lot of acids that are produced, like lactic acid and other types of acids that are produced inside the muscle cells. And of course, acids change the pH of our muscle cells. And what kind of things have we talked about are really sensitive to, oh, and not only does acid change, but we also, as we know, produce heat, temperature change. What types of things have we talked about are super sensitive to temperature changes and pH changes? Proteins. Enzymes. Proteins, enzymes too, but in general, proteins. 
And remind me again what muscle cells are chalk filled with? Proteins. Proteins. Massive, massive numbers of proteins. And so that change in temperature, change in pH, can disrupt the function of these proteins. One protein in particular that is highly sensitive to pH changes, as it turns out, is troponin. When the pH changes, troponin changes just enough that it makes it a little harder for the calcium to bind to it. So think about this. We decide to contract the muscle, we produce the muscle action potential, it spreads down the sarcolemma, spreads down the transverse tubules, opens up the voltage-gated calcium channels, all this calcium rushes into the cytosol. But now, because of the change of shape, not as many calcium can bind to the troponins, which means we're not as able to move as many regulatory proteins, meaning fewer mice and heads can grab and pull, and suddenly our muscle is contracting weaker than it was doing before. So something just as simple as that, that change in the shape of a protein like troponin can decrease the efficiency of the muscle cell. Now, we are definitely gonna talk about uh, uh, fatigue and all of the implications about that. Because of that, modification is not going to be a possible essay question on the exam. So again, remember we have the three questions for the communication at the neuromuscular junction, initiation, termination, and modification. But for here, uh, it will be uh, just excitation and termination. So, so far we have five possible essay questions. We will get to birds and why they can fly longer as we've built up and we see different uh, muscle cells. Laura, what's your question? I don't know if it kind of, um ties into this, but like the temp change. Um, so you said the troponin doesn't really like it. So is that why sometimes they either um, have to cover their arm to keep it warm or to ice it? To kind of so great question. So when, so when a pitcher in between innings is covering his arm or, you know, or putting the jacket over his arm or things, it is to keep the muscle warmed up. Again, the, uh, why birds can fly longer uh, and things like that, why you can stand longer than you can hold yourself in a plank position. We will answer all of these questions and this is one we'll get to as well. But the short answer to your question is, the reason they keep it wrapped up is they wanna keep it warm. They wanna keep the ligaments loose. They wanna keep the muscle relaxed and well vascularized. Blood goes to the area more when it's, when it's warmed up. And so it helps to maintain functionality. When they're done pitching and they go to the, uh, you know, and they go to the, the, the dugout after that, that's when they put the big bunch of ice on there to reduce the swelling, to reduce the inflammation from all the damage that they've been doing from trying to throw a ball 100 miles an hour, 75, 80, 103 times in a single baseball game. So it's to decrease the inflammation so that the recovery can occur more quickly in those. So yes, so they go, they want to keep it warm when they're, when they're, when they're still playing. And as soon as they're done playing, they want to cool it down. And so that has to do more with the recovery and maintenance, which are definitely things we will talk more about as we move forward as well. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, questions on this. So as like I said, we've hit our fifth possible essay question and answered all of those. So my, I have a question, yep. but it's a little not fully related. Okay. Um, you mentioned we make, okay, so when our muscles get not enough ATP, well, sorry, when we don't have glucose, we switch to making lactose. Is that bad for the lactose to build up? Is my first question. Oh. And my second question is, is, is that how we burn our fat storage is when we do anaerobic respiration? No. So the, 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 the answer to your first question is yes. And, and again, we will talk about fatigue and producing lactic acid in a muscle absolutely is a bad thing for that muscle. Absolutely. Um, for the, and then we will talk about the ways that we produce energy and how that relates to that as well. Um, not a dumb question at all, Arthur. Um, you are correct in that uh, increased blood flow to an area 
uh, can help to uh, remove things like the lactic acid and can help in the recovery of it. So it's one of the reasons why, for instance, stretching after exercise is so important because it's it, it, it smoothly moves the muscle in a way to increase circulation so you don't get congestion, you can get rid of the lactic acid, you can get more oxygen to it. It is definitely good in that way. Typically, the, uh, the ice that they're putting is more to reduce inflammation in the joints. So the, the ice isn't so much about the muscles, it's more about the joints that they're trying to reduce the inflammation in. So they typically, you see it on their elbow or you see it on their shoulder because they're trying to reduce the inflammation in the joint. So you're right, uh, increased blood flow is better for the muscle, but muscle is a little bit more dynamic than the connective tissues in a joint. So typically they put that ice on to reduce the swelling in the joint. Yep. All right, awesome questions. Any others? All right, spectacular. That is step two, everything we need to know for that. Uh, this is, we went a little long, but uh, again, you guys were asking great questions and I will never complain about that. So I think that that is awesome. Uh, let's go ahead and take our first break. We'll take a 15 minute break, come back at one uh, forty-five, And at one forty-five, we will pick up the lecture from there. So we will start with the lecture at one forty-five, and I'll go ahead and leave this on the screen. All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. We are now two thirds of the way through our muscle contraction process, and we are on to step three. What is the third phase of our muscle contraction? Contractile cycle. Excellent. And was there another name we could use instead of contractile cycle? Equally acceptable? I'm asking the question, so the obvious answer is yes. So what is the other acceptable name for this process? <clears throat> sliding film sliding theory. Film theory. There you go, exactly. Excellent sliding filament theory. And of course, as always, we need a goal. What is our goal here? To force tension to change the shape of the muscle. Excellent. We want to produce tension or force. Again, either is an acceptable term. And that tension and force is going to change the shape of the muscle cell. Excellent. Remember, it is going to start where excitation contraction coupling ended. And what was our last step? in excitation contraction coupling. The filaments go back to its original place. Okay, well that was in the relaxation part, but when we wanted to actually initiate the process, so we are still talking about initiation here. What was it that, what was the last thing we did when we were initiating the process? Actin binds to the mice. Right, why is actin able to bind to the myosin? Or more specifically, the myosin bind to the actin. Because remember, um, it's the mice in the moves. Is the troponin moved out of the way? Well, the troponin moved the tropomyosin out of the way. Exactly. Troponin uh, rotates. And when it rotates, it moves <clears throat> the uh, tropomyosin off the actin. Well, they, let's say it this way, the active site, on actin, and allows myosin and actin to interact. Excellent. So that is our start, because that is what basically happened at the end of step two, and therefore is the beginning of step three. And let's cheat a little bit here. And what is the end of this? Would it be well, muscle contraction? 
True. We want the muscle to contract. Absolutely. That is our end goal ultimately is to get the muscle to contract. But let's go back to the name. It's a contractile cycle. And what do we know about cycles? They go back. It's continuous. It's a continuous process. Absolutely. So because it is a continuous process, it really doesn't have one. Right. Once the contractile process starts, it keeps going, which is why we're able to maintain that contraction until we ultimately decide to stop it. <clears throat> so that is our goal. Our goal, once again, is to talk about the contractile cycle now, what's going on with that sliding filament theory, how we are changing the shape of the muscle, how we are changing uh, the producing the tension that is necessary. And once again, just like before, we need to start by talking first about the anatomy. And here, the important anatomy is our sarcomere. So let's remind us ourselves again, once more of the basic anatomy of a single sarcomere, starting easy. What are the boundaries of a sarcomere? The Z line. Exactly, the Z line, or, or the protein remembers the Z disc, but Z line is okay. So we have our Z discs, excellent. Um, our Z disc is the boundary of our sarcomere, but it also is an anchor point to something. What connects to the sarcomere? The um, is it actin? Actin, absolutely. So we know we have our thread-like actin. And let's, that made that probably a little too long. Oops, nope, I want to shorten it. There we go. Excellent. And then we can put another one here. And we can put another one here. And same thing here, and same thing here. Excellent. All right. Actin, remember, is. Oh, not sure what's going on there. Oh, I can see what's going on. I don't want to do that. I want that. Straighten it out, make it a little longer. Pretend like they're close. They're lined up. They're supposed to be precise, but you get the idea. <clears throat> Actin is one of our contractile proteins, but what is the second one again? Myosin. Myosin. So we have that nice, big, thick myosin in the center. Excellent. And we know that the myosin has these myosin heads that come off of and up to this point in time, I've just been drawing them as a simple straight line. But we know these myosin heads are more than that. The myosin head is a big important structure. And remember our myosin head is our motor. Remember, a motor converts chemical energy into mechanical energy. And what is the chemical energy it is going to use? ATP. ATP, absolutely. So what our myosin head is able to do is it is able to actually hold on to an ATP. And when it holds on to that ATP, it is actually able to split the ATP. When the myosin head splits the ATP, when you rip off a phosphate of an ATP, what do you get as a result of that? Obviously, you get the phosphate you rip off, but what's the other thing that you get as well? Chemical energy. Well, true, you're releasing the energy, absolutely. Would it be the ADP? Exactly. You are going to get 
uh, a you're going to get a phosphate you are going to get uh, adp and you are going to get energy those are the three things that are going to be here in this and i guess i have to make this smaller to fit it into the head and it stores all of those so it splits the atp into adp plus a phosphate plus energy. And when it does that, it stores all three things. And when it stores all three things, hold on a second, Laura, it is considered primed. And this primed head does one more thing. A primed myosin head points away from the M line. Someone remind me again what the M line is? Where the two, um, kind of where they all bind together, right? True, you're absolutely, at the, at the center of our sarcomere, there is a row of three interlocking proteins. What type of proteins are these again? What's the name of this protein? Is it titin? Nope, close. Myomycin. And it forms the M line. So notice when our myosin heads are primed, and I won't put the ADP and the phosphate and the energy in all of them, but what I will show you is that on both sides, the left and the right, when those myosin heads are primed, they're pointing away from the M line. So that means the ones on the left are pointing left, the ones on the right are pointing right. Yes, Laura, now I'll answer your question. Um, would that be considered the cross bridge or, or is that something completely different? Something completely different, but you absolutely have the right idea. We're getting to that, absolutely. That's gonna happen next. We need to finish the anatomy first before we can start talking about the function, but absolutely, that is going to lead to our big you know, mechanical process, which is forming that cross bridge, absolutely. All right, so here we see an example of two myosin filaments with eight uh, primed myosin heads that have all split the ADP, ATP into ADP, phosphate, and energy. They're ready to do work they're primed, right? Primed, cocked, energized, whatever term you want to use for them, they're ready to do work, right? And that's the key. They're ready to do work because they are pointed away from the M line. <clears throat> now, of course, while they may be primed and ready to do work, as we also know, there is those pesky regulatory proteins our tropomyosin and our troponin that are blocking the myosin from grabbing onto the actin, stopping it from doing its work. So here we've got all of our uh, troponins in place. Tropomyosin, hold on. Tropomyosin. And we also know that on there, and we'll just draw it again as a block, is that handle the troponin that our calcium is binding onto. Yes, Laura. So I think that's where I'm kind of getting confused. So the trop tropomyosin is the line and the troponin is binds to the calcium or? Yes, exactly. The tropomyosin is the long thread-like protein that sits on top of the um, actin blocking the binding site and the troponin is the handle on it that can move it out of the way okay. Thank you. notice and here let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook again here we have a simple resting sarcomere that we're drawing right now as we speak notice we have the z disc we have the myomycin we have our myosin all the myosin heads are primed pointing away from the m line uh, we have the actin. Notice they've drawn the titan, 
connecting it to the end and they don't have the regulatory proteins. But what I really like is this picture from your textbook. Notice that this picture from your textbook. Here we see two pieces of myosin. So notice they're taking this chunk right from here. Here is that actin in the center. Remember it's a dimer. And notice the orange part on them, or I guess the yellow part on them, is the binding site for the myosin. Notice our myosin heads are primed. They've already split the ATP into ADP and phosphate. They're storing it along with the energy. And notice because we're on the right side, they're pointed away from the M line, so they're pointing to the right. They really, 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 really want to be able to grab onto that actin, but they can't because that gosh darn tropomyosin is in the way, blocking the binding sites. Luckily, we have little handles here in the troponin, which we know we can sprinkle some calcium on and we'll move them out of the way. So if you don't like my simplistic drawing, then hopefully this little uh, more elaborate artistic one can explain what we're looking at from an anatomy standpoint. All right. Okay. Yeah, troponin and tropomyosin do sound similar. They are both regulatory proteins, so it's not surprising that their names are the same or similar. The way I remember is the tropomyosin is the one that stops the myosin. Right, so the tropomyosin is the one that blocks the myosin from grabbing onto the actin. And then the troponin is the one that's going to turn it. I kind of think of the troponin like a gear almost. That's how I try to remember it, like moving like sure. a plate around. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. It's like a lever. It's a pulley. Absolutely. It's good. It's, its job is to, to move that pesky tropomyosin out of the way. All righty. Are we comfortable with this basic anatomy? So again, remember, if the anatomy yeah. doesn't make sense, yeah, well, because like everything we talk about, uh, everything is far more complicated than we are uh, discussing in this class, but it's a good starting point. All right, excellent. Well, then here's what I'm going to do. Now that we have our anatomy, and I think I saved this, but I'll save it just again, just to make sure. What I'm going to do, because basically the same thing that happens right here is the same thing that happens right here, is the same thing that happens right here, is the same thing that happens right here, and so on and so forth. So to simplify things, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab this piece. So just going to grab this piece. Well, again, the sky is blue. Remember, this class, the sky is blue. When you get to graduate school, when you get to nursing school, when you get to medical school, that's when you get to hear about when the sky is gray and the sky is orange and the sky is red and the sky is black and all those others. But in this class, the sky is blue. So what we are going to do is we are going to just cut out this quadrant because the same thing that's happening here is the same thing that happens everywhere else. And so if we can understand what's happening here, we can make sense of the contractile cycle. All right, so let's do that. Uh, to do that, I guess I need to, unfortunately, erase all of this. I wonder if I can, no, that's not gonna let me do that at all, is it? Oh, well, that's all right. Clear. Step three, contractile cycle. Or sliding filament there. Let's be thorough. And again, our goal generate our force, really generate a tension that changes the shape of the cell. Generate changes the, let's even be more specific, length of the cell. That is our goal. Now, as we know, this process starts with the troponin rotating the tropomyosin off of the active site on the actin. So 
let's look at our starting point. For our starting point, and let's get our anatomy again. We have our actin, which is connected to our Z disc. We have our myosin. And again, we'll just look at one primed myosin head. We know it's a prime myosin head because again, it's pointing toward the Z disc, it's pointing away from the M line. And that means here on the inside, we know it has an ADP plus a phosphate plus the energy ready to do work. And at this point, Our troponin with its two calcium on it have moved the tropomyosin out of the way. So our binding site on the actin has been exposed. All right, are we comfortable with that? Again, all we've done is taken that previous view and taken here and we're looking at our starting point in just one quadrant of this. All right, so again, from here the fun begins. So I wanna make sure we understand this before we move any further. Any questions on this before we start the process? No. Nope. At this point it hasn't, they haven't um, binded, correct? Nope, they have not bonded yet, but you are absolutely correct. Now that that pesky uh, tropomyosin is out of the way, that's absolutely positively the very first thing that is going to happen. The absolute positively first thing that is going to happen is our myosin head is going to bind to our actin. And that's exactly what happens first. So now, with those pesky regulatory proteins out of the way, our myosin head with its ADP, with its phosphate, with its energy, is able to bind to the actin. And that's exactly what is going to happen. The first step in this cycle, and again, we gotta be careful with first because again, it is a continuous process. The blue, oh, oh, those are calcium up there. The dots on the troponin are the calcium. So here we can label all that stuff to remind us. Calcium, troponin, tropomycin. There we go. Excellent. So, oops, you stay there. Get out of my way. You're the troponin, and you're the calcium. All right. There we go, that helped. All right, so first thing that is going to happen is that our primed myosin head binds to the active site on the actin. This process is what we call forming a cross bridge. The forming that cross bridge is the myosin grabbing onto that handhold of the uh, of the actin. Or the other way I think of it is like grabbing onto a rope, right? If you're gonna pull on a rope, first thing you have to do is grab onto that rope, right? So you have to make that attachment. And so that's what the myosin is doing. The myosin is grabbing onto the actin, grabbing onto that rope, grabbing onto that handhold forming that cross bridge. Now, notice as we've talked about with this primed myosin head, it is storing the ADP, the phosphate and the energy and it can't release it. it 
now finally that it has formed this cross bridge, it is now finally finally going to be able to release the energy. It's finally going to be able to do its work. And that is exactly what it is going to do. Once it forms that cross bridge, it is going to do its work. It turns out the work of the myosin head, exactly. So it turns out the work of the myosin head, once it binds, our myosin head is going to perform a power stroke. And Laura, you are absolutely correct. What that power stroke means is that the myosin head pivots towards the M line. So what happens is that myosin head uses the energy to pivot towards the M line. Oops. So it's pivoting towards the M line. Now think of the implications of this. It's grabbing on to the my uh, to the actin and then it's pulling. So as it pulls that, as it pivots, it is going to pull the actin towards the M line. And guess what? It's also the actin is connected to the Z disk. So it is going to pull the Z disk towards the M line. Uh, you start off with using troponin that moves tropomyosin to leave the active site open, yeah, allowing myosin and actin to bind. Form a cross bridge. No, the ATP was already split before it forms the cross bridge. It can't form a cross bridge if it hasn't already split the ATP. Oh, okay. So it has to split the ATP into ADP and phosphate first. That's what energizes it and allows it to be able to grab onto the actin and pull. So it cannot perform a, it cannot form a cross bridge until it is already split the ATP, which remember, uh, primes it, energizes it, cocks it, whatever term you want to use for pointing it away from the M line so that it is ready to do work. Okay. Yeah. So let's think of the implications of this. Like we said, the myosin head pivots it towards the M line using the energy. And in that process, it pulls the actin towards the M line which pulls the Z disc towards the M line. And remember, this is happening on both sides. The myosin heads on the right are grabbing and pulling towards the middle. The myosin heads on the left are grabbing and pulling towards the middle. So as those myosin heads are grabbing the actin, pulling the actin, the Z discs are being moved towards the M line. What happens to the length of my sarcomere? Shortens. Absolutely. The length of our sarcomere gets shorter. And not just this sarcomere, but all of the sarcomeres in a myofibril. So that means my myofibril gets shorter. And remember, thanks to the myomycin and other structural proteins, these structural proteins are connected to the plasma membrane of the cell. So when the, the myofibril that runs the entire length of the cell gets smaller, then that means my muscle cell gets smaller. And lo and behold, 
we have achieved our goal. We generated a force. And we changed the length of the muscle cell. Boom. Mission accomplished. Right here is where we're generating the force. Here is where we're using that energy, like we talked about, to convert that chemical energy into a mechanical energy, shortening the muscle, generating that tension, producing that force that ultimately is going to move us through space. Excellent. However, if my goal is just simply to pick up this pen, can I lift up this pen with just one myosin head grabbing and pulling one time? No. No. These, uh, these myosin uh, are tiny. One power stroke of one myosin head only changes the length of a muscle by half of a percent. So one myosin head pulling by itself is not going to be enough. We're going to need many. Just like you climbing that ladder, you grabbing onto the rung and pulling down on the rung doesn't suddenly get you to the top of the ladder. You need to grab and pull many times to reach the top of the level, the ladder. And so the same thing's happening here. This is a great start. This is where we've produced the power stroke. This is where we've generated our force, but we need to do it many times. And Let's think about this again, like climbing the rat ladder. We move the plexiglass out of the way. I grab the rung, right? I form my cross bridge. I performed my power stroke. I moved up the ladder a little bit. And if I want to, with my right hand here, grab and pull again, what's the very next thing I have to do with my right hand? You have to let go. I have to let go. Because before I can reach to grab and pull again, I have to let go. And so that's what we need to do next. What we need to do next is to let go. Do you want to take a picture of this for us? I will. I've taken pictures for all of these things as we've been going through them. Thank you. Of course, I'm not going to do it till I'm done, but yes, I will. All right. So what we need to do is get this myosin head to let go. However, there's one other thing we need to learn about. Notice when it used the energy, to, it performed its power stroke. But during the power stroke, oops, this doesn't need to be all in caps. Our myosin head releases the ADP and the phosphate. It's not using them anymore. So what it does is while it's performing its power stroke, it is just going to let go of the ADP and the phosphate. And that's useful because then what that means is we now have an open binding site for a new ATP. And that's exactly what's going to happen. A new ATP binds to the myosin head. That binding causes the myosin head to let go of the actin. Just the binding. It's not using any of the energy or anything else. Just the binding of a new ATP causes the myosin to let go of the actin. What we say here is that it breaks the cross bridge. So what happens here? Here's our myosin head. A brand new ATP 
and to remind us that it's new, let's make it orange. Comes in and binds to our myosin head. And when it binds to our myosin head, our myosin head, let's go. Oh, I want that blue. It breaks the cross bridge. Myosin releases the actin. Notice at this point, our actin, the hand hole on the ladder is now free, ready to be used. But is our myosin head ready to do work yet? No. 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 Notice our myosin head has released uh, the actin, but not ready to do work. What does it have to do to get ready to do work? Prime itself again. Hmm? Um, it has to prime itself again or release it. Right. And how does it get primed? Mm, changes ATP into ADP. Bingo. So to get ready to do work, the myosin head splits the ATP. When it splits the ATP, it now contains ADP plus phosphate plus energy. And this primes or revitalizes or recocks Myosin head, pointing it away from the M line so that it's ready to do work. So it splits the ADP into ADP and phosphate. That primes the myosin head. So it's pointed away from the M line, has its ADP, a phosphate, and energy. Hold on a second, Laura. If it's primed and the regulatory proteins are out of the way, then it's able to grab onto uh, the actin forming that cross bridge. When it forms that cross bridge, it's able to use that energy to perform its power stroke, pulling on the actin, pulling on the Z disc, making the sarcomere shorter, making the muscle cell shorter, generating our tension. Once it's used that energy and released the ADP and phosphate, it has room for a new ATP to come in, which breaks the cross bridge. Once you break the cross bridge, it then has to split the ATP to be primed and the process continues around and around and around the cycle because it is indeed a cycle, the cycle goes. Yes, Laura, your question. Um, yeah, so when, at what point does, um are the actin and myosin know when to stop the cycle? We'll get to that in a second. You're absolutely correct. So you're, I love how you're thinking ahead, but let's make sure we understand how to produce the contraction first. Then we'll talk about how we relax it. All right. So the, that part is, isn't, con, or it's not part of the, the whole cycle, right? Once it- No, because again, remember, this is what's happening where I'm changing the muscle length and I'm changing the contraction. And I'm as long as this cycle goes, I'm gonna continue to contract that muscle and I'm gonna continue to keep that muscle contract, generating that tension and keeping that muscle contracted. That's why it's a cycle, it continues. Now, again, I'm not going to want to keep this muscle contracted forever. Eventually, I will want to terminate it. I will want to stop it, and that's when it'll relax. But as long as I want to keep that contraction going, I can keep that contraction going. And that's because this is a continuous process. So as long as, and again, if you think about it, there's really only two things we need. We need calcium to move the regulatory proteins, and we need ATP. As long as we still have those two things present in the muscle, the muscle is going to continue to contract. All right. And I appreciate the offer, Dimitro, but uh, I'd rather you guys focused on learning it as opposed to uh, 
helping me with my drawings. Professor, this is what we had on our, I think it was mastering a &P maybe, or was it, um, I, I forgot which one it was, but it looks like one of the exercises that we had to do. Wouldn't surprise me. Okay. Yeah. It, it's just, I like the fact that over there, it was showed like, rather than see you're drawing and showing each step individually, they had like the whole motion thing going on, which really helped out. Absolutely. The, yeah, absolutely. The, the AMP flicks are amazing because they're high resolution animations that show absolutely. So the lab simulator has got that, the, the, uh, yeah, the AMP flicks, there are lots of great resources that absolutely show this process. And yeah, I agree. Seeing it, continuously. Makes it, a, yeah, it makes it a lot easier to understand what you're talking okay. about. Now. There you go. Exactly. Perfect. Excellent. And again, that's why we have all these different modalities for learning this stuff. All right. And your textbooks also got some pretty nice pictures that do a pretty decent job of showing this as well. Let's go through this again one more time here. Hold on, let me switch back to that. One more quick question. Yes. On, Friday, on Fridays, um, the, the little lab, the- Open lab, yeah. Oh, the open lab, he goes over this also, all of these stuff? Uh, he can. Uh, again, the open lab is more for the lab materials. Uh, so to like see the models, see the charts, see the materials that way. Uh, but if, uh, if he's not required to go through any of those materials, he can answer questions like, uh, like processes. But, it, but the point of that is more for an opportunity to see and, and not quite work with, but to see and, and, and go over the materials in the class, see the models, see the charts, see those types of resources. He definitely has these types of models, uh, but it's not so much the, 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 the processes. He's not there for the physiology, he's there for the anatomy. Got it, okay. Yeah. All right, we've done it on the board. Let's go through it one more time with the pretty pictures from your textbook. Again, here is our starting point. Our troponin and tropomyosin are blocking the active site. Our myosin heads are primed and ready to do work. It split the ATP into ADP and phosphate and it's pointed away from the M line, primed, ready to do work. And again, because those regulatory proteins are in the way, the muscle is relaxed. So, how does the contractile cycle begin? The same way excitation contraction coupling ended. Calcium binds to the troponin. Our troponin undergoes that conformational change and it rotates the tropomyosin out of the way. So now the binding sites on the actin are exposed. And now that they're exposed, our primed myosin head is able to grab onto the actin. Of course, we have a fancy word for that. We say it's forming a cross bridge. So our energized or primed uh, myosin head binds to the actin forming that cross bridge. Again, it can only be a prime myosin head that is tilted away from the M line in that primed or cocked position. Once it binds, it's finally able to use its energy. The binding of the head allows it to release its energy and it performs its power stroke. The head pivots towards the M line. And as it does that, it pulls on the actin, it pulls on the Z disc. Notice during that power stroke, it also releases the ADP and phosphate which means that there is now an open binding site here inside of our act, I mean, of our myosin for a new ATP to bind to it. And that's what happens. A new ATP, an eight new, blah, blah, blah. A new ATP binds to the myosin head and causes the break of the uh, cross bridge. However, it's not going to be ready to do work again until it oops, splits that ATP into ADP and phosphate, reprimes, recocks the head, pointing away from the M line, and now it's ready to form a cross bridge. I like these pictures from your textbook, but my favorite version of this is actually this one. That's not from your textbook, but I like it a ton. And so I think it's really, really worthwhile. Notice. 
Here, we're forming the cross bridge, binding to the actin. Once it binds to the actin, it performs its power stroke, using the energy to pivot towards the M line, pulling the actin, pulling on the Z disc, and releasing the ADP and phosphate as it goes. Once it's spent, we need a new ATP to bind to it. And when it does, it breaks the cross bridge. It lets go of the actin. The binding site on the actin is now open again, but our myosin head isn't ready to do work yet. It has to split this ATP into ADP and phosphate, and that revitalizes the head. So the head is primed, ready to grab, and ready to do it again. This process of the myosin head grabbing, pulling, letting go, reaching, grab, pull, let go, reach, grab, pull, let go, reach, again and again and again and again, right? Basically those four steps to this cycle continuously going around. And while I sit here going, grab, pull, let go, reach, these myosin heads on average do that about five times per second, right? So they grab, pull, let go, reach, and they do that whole cycle five times a second. And remember, each myosin filament has hundreds of myosin heads. Are they all grabbing at the same time, reaching at the same time, pulling at the same time, letting go at the same time? Is that how you climb a ladder? You grab the rungs with both hands, pull yourself up with both hands, let go with both hands so you can reach again with both hands? No. No, right? You're gonna alternate them. And so that same thing's happening here. All the myosin heads are grabbing, pulling, releasing, uh, reaching all at different timing with each other so that at any one time, some's pulling, some are letting go, some are reaching. And in this continuous process, we shorten the muscle, right? And remember, as we said, each contractile cycle, each power stroke basically shortens the muscle cell about half of a percent. So one contractile cycle is not a huge amount. But when you put all of them together at the same time, you're able to move that body through space and lift up that table or carry that chair or do all those other things. All right. Excellent. So that is that. Questions on the contractile cycle. And notice, I didn't say initiation of the contractile cycle. I just said contractile cycle. So let's get back to, I think Laura was the one that asked it. Now that we know how to start the cycle, how do we turn it off? Um, the trypomycin or the troponin blocking the binding sites on the actin. Exactly. Or the troponin, no more calcium. Our troponin with no calcium goes back to its original shape and rotates back over. Now look and see what happens. Our myosin head grabs, our myosin head pulls, our myosin head lets go, our myosin head reaches. And now when it's trying to grab onto the actin again, it can no longer grab onto the actin. So basically the way we stop the cycle by moving the tropomyosin back over the active site of actin. Notice one sentence answers don't make good essay questions. So really, we don't have to worry about modification. We don't have to worry about initiation or termination for this particular essay question. All we have to worry about is the contractile cycle. Describe the contractile cycle. Now, let's go back to one more thing you guys already talked about, but this is a good place to talk about it as well. Notice we just finished mentioning how all this needs is calcium or ATP to keep going. We know that the decision to relax the muscle locks all the calcium away. So when the calcium goes away, 
the muscle is going to relax. And as we also talked about, is there really any time in your life where you don't have any ATP in your cells? When you're dead. When you're dead. Remember, as we talked about, when you die, when you're first dead, does the body instantly go rigid? We talked about that rigor mortis. Does the body instantly go rigid when we die? No, it takes no. several hours. No. It takes time, several hours. And the reason for that is the cell uses up the ATP that's inside of it. Uh, the calcium slowly sneaks into the cell, but eventually that calcium, as we talked about, is gonna sneak into the cell and bind to the troponin and move the tropomyosins out of the way. Our myosin heads are already primed. So they're gonna grab onto the actin and they're gonna perform the power stroke, but when you're dead, is there any ATP left to cause that breaking of the cross bridge? Ah, oh, that makes sense. No. no. So that's why you so stay. Now, yeah. Now your myosin head is basically locked in that position. And that's why the muscle locks into that position and your body stays rigid because all your myosin heads have performed their power strokes, but they can't let go. Now, one more question. Once rigor mortis sets in, does the body stay in rigor mortis forever? You have to have coffins that are shaped in the way of the body when the person died so that they can fit in them? No. 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 Eventually, the body goes limp again. Anyone know why the body goes limp? Decomposition. Exactly. As the body starts to decompose, oops, hold on. As the body starts to decompose, the proteins break. The actin breaks, the myosin heads break up, the Z discs start to break. As the proteins start to break down, there's no more tension in the muscle and the muscle basically becomes flaccid again. They can kind of tell how long someone has been dead because we know how long these processes take, right? And of course there are a lot of factors, temperature, humidity, all sorts of other things that can influence it, but right, they actually have, you know, out in swamps and place like that, they actually have body farms where they're monitoring, right? What the difference in the decomposition rate of a body that is exposed to the elements by one versus one that's wrapped up in a blanket, right? And wrapped up in a flannel blanket versus a cloth blanket and all sorts of things like that. They do all this type of research so that we can get some idea of when we find a body by looking at its state, we can get a general idea of how long it's been dead. Again, most of us have heard of rigor mortis before. We're aware that it occurred, but you never knew why. Now you actually know how and why rigor mortis occurs. All right. Questions on that? No question, but just a random fact about this. There's like bodies on Mount Everest of people who have died when they're trying to climb the mountain, but they... Yeah unsafe to take them down, but it's so cold that they're, they've been there for 10, 20 years and they're still there and they use and them more, as like yeah. landmarks. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. The Sherpas know that too, right? You turn left at Phil, right? Take a and right at Bobby and Sue or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It, it's, it is tragic, but, uh, but it is, it, it, again, it, because of that extreme condition, absolutely. The bodies basically are so cold that bacteria really can't get in there and cause any decomposition. Yep. Awesome. Any other questions? All right. Where are we time-wise? We are doing good. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Um, all right, let's do one more thing. Because it's still fresh in our heads, I think now is a good time to do this. If you think about it, as I mentioned on the very first day, that there were basically 10 essay questions because we had three steps, but all of them had initiations, all of them had terminations, all of them had modifications. Uh, but as we've learned, that's not actually going to be the case. So remember to emphasize what I've said to you numerous times, uh, there are seven essay questions that I guarantee you are in the test banks on this exam.
And I guarantee you as a student are going to get at least two of them. Which two? I have no idea. Uh, again, one of the bad things about this random uh, number generator that we use to determine the essays, because again, since we're online, I can't give you all the same tests uh, because the timing for when you guys take your tests and all the pain in the butt things that go along with that. So it's all completely random. But being the smart, sophisticated students that you are, you can identify the seven essay questions, practice those seven essay questions so you know exactly what they are. So let's identify them. The first one, of course, is initiation of communication at the neuromuscular junction. And that's exactly what I would ask. Identify and describe the steps of initiation of communication at the neuromuscular junction. Or identify and describe, right? You always want to describe uh, the steps of termination of communication at, and I'm just going to cheat and abbreviate it there, neuromuscular junction. We'll put a star by three here because this is our modification. I'm not gonna ask you, how do you modify communication at the neuromuscular junction? What I more likely would say is, how does toxin X modify communication at the neuromuscular junction? So that's basically how I would ask that modification question. How does toxin X, and remember we talked about tetanus, we talked about a karari, we talked about botulinum toxin, or maybe I'll come up with some other toxin or make up a toxin or something like that and ask you what would happen at the neuromuscular junction if we made this change, right? So again, I'm not gonna say describe modification at the neuromuscular junction. This would be how I would ask that question. All right, question four. Identify and describe the steps of initiation of excitation, contraction, coupling. And of course, termination of excitation, contraction, coupling. And lastly, Contractile cycle of the sliding filament theory. And there you go. Those are your seven essay questions that I guarantee you will have two of them on the exam. All right, questions on that? You don't have to create a screenshot it. I've said it to you numerous times. That's what I was looking for. Maximilian's got it, right? Is Maximilian the only problem person who has a problem with this? I was gonna ask, but I was like, maybe you made a mistake. I don't make mistakes. Okay. I'm married with children. <laughs> I'm a white male. I don't make mistakes. <laughs> No, I purposely made the mistake here because again, what I want to point out is that absolutely, there is a seventh question that we talked about way back at the beginning. And that seventh question is that fourth step. Ew. Now, I know that sounds intimidating when we think of that, but really, the key to remember about step seven here, and actually let me cheat and put this back over here. There is no new information in muscle relaxation. If I ask you to describe how a muscle relaxes, Basically, all you're doing is telling me how you terminate communication at the neuromuscular junction and how you terminate excitation contraction coupling. 
Uh, remember, the reason there's a star by three is because I'm not going to ask the question, how do you modify communication at the neuromuscular junction? The way I will ask the question is by asking it like this. Uh, how does toxin X modify communication? So that's how I'll ask. So that's the only reason that's there. Sure, absolutely. Or I could combine them, right? Uh, describe, you know, two. I give you two different toxins and tell her something like that, or three, all three of them, absolutely. But I will give you a specific toxin and ask you how it modifies communication at the neuromuscular junction. Or some other thing, right? You know, what if I what if I say there's no more motor end plates or something like that? Or I don't know. I could, you know, there's lots of ways that I can modify it, but it's a way of showing me you understand the process. So Essay question seven is really essay question two and five combined. And the way I look at it, since we have already identified step uh, two and already identified essay question five, why don't you guys put it all together for me? Why don't we do that? Why don't we actually go through and put it all together so that if I ask you the question, how do you relax a muscle? You can tell me what the answer is. So step one, what is the very first step in relaxing a muscle? Would you need to state that there's no new action potential going down the axon terminal and therefore it repolarizes the cell? Absolutely. But remember, you've already got the right idea. We want to go from the very first thing, which is we make the decision to relax. But then you're absolutely correct. When we make the decision to relax, there's no new neural action potentials uh, traveling down the neuron. What the heck, somatic motor neuron. I'll be as precise as possible as I can with this. Absolutely. Uh, so the neuron repolarizes, absolutely, which means our synaptic M bulb. Repolarizes, excellent. When our synaptic M bulb repolarizes, what's the immediate effect of that? The calcium channels close. Right, although again, we wanna be precise voltage gated calcium channels close. Excellent. And so of course, when those close, there's no new calcium into the synaptic M bulb. However, we still have all that calcium in the synaptic M bulb we need to get rid of. So how do we get rid of that? The calcium pumps. Excellent. Calcium pumps, remove calcium, from the synaptic M bulb. Once the calcium's out of synaptic M bulb, what happens? No we calcium to bind to the troponin. Well, no, remember that's what's happening in the mu muscle cell. We're not quite to the muscle cell yet. We're still in the synaptic M bulb. What was the calcium doing in the synaptic M bulb? Uh, it was triggering exocytosis. Excellent, it was triggering the exocytosis of acetylcholine. Well, now there's no more calcium, so what can no longer happen? Exocytosis. Yeah, no more. To state in there that the threshold is reached of, or the resting membrane potential is reached. We could do that. Important to you. So drops below threshold for voltage gated channels. Sure, if you'd wanted to put that in there, that would be fine. So no more exocytosis of acetylcholine. All right, so there's no new acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. But remember, that's only half of our problem. We still need to remove the acetylcholine that is already in the synaptic cleft. And how many ways did we have to do that? Three. Excellent. What were they? Uh, breaking down with acetylcholine esterase. 
endocytosis back. Uh, Hold on, I'm not that good of a typer. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> Esterase. Uh, what else? Uh, endocytosis. Back into synaptic M bulb. And or there you go. Ariel's got it, diffusion away from motor end plate. Excellent. I'm going to make this a little bigger. I think I have room for it all. Excellent. Diffuses away from the motor end plate. So now there is no acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. And what's the implication of that? With no acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft, what's going to happen? The motor end plate repolarizes. OK, why? What was this? Again, think what was the acetylcholine doing? It has something to do with sodium and potassium, but I'm right. not sure. So anybody, anybody help her out. What was the acetylcholine doing at the motor end plate? It was opening those gates for um... What I'm... kind of gates? Mm. There we go. Excellent. Are chemically gated cation channels close, right? Because that's what acetylcholine was doing, was opening our chemically gated cation channels. Uh, so it was opening them. So without the acetylcholine, our chemically gated cation channels close, right? When they close, what happens? No new sodium and no, uh, sorry, no new sodium enters and no new potassium exits. And notice how I put the potassium exits in parentheses because remember, do equal amounts of these move? No. No, it's mostly sodium. And remember, mostly that sodium rushing inside is what makes the cell depo uh, depolarized and brings it to threshold. So with no new sodium entering into the cell, the motor end plate repolarizes. And when it repolarizes, no new muscle action potentials are produced. And if there's no new muscle action potentials, down the sarcolemma. What happens when there's no more muscle action potentials down the sarcolemma? Where else did that muscle action potential go besides down the sarcolemma? Or instead of across the sarcolemma, where else did it go? Transverse tubule. Right. So no muscle action potential down the transverse tubule. Right. We're getting to that. We're getting to that. Absolutely. So that means that not only our transverse tubule, but the T tubule and the two terminal cisternae, which together form the triad, repolarize. And when what happens when our terminal cisternae repolarize? Voltage-gated calcium channels close. Excellent. So no new calcium into the cytosol. We still have calcium in the cytosol we have to get rid of. How did we get rid of that calcium in the cytosol? The calcium pumps. Pumps, excellent. With no calcium? There's a decrease in calcium in the cytosol. Yep. And so what happens when there's no more calcium in the cytosol? The troponin rotates back. Calcium binding to troponin. Troponin returns to its original shape and when it goes back to its original shape, what happens? It blocks the active sites of, of uh, actin. 
we have tropomyosin, right? Troponin rotates tropomyosin over the active site on actin. And when troponin's over the active site of actin, the myosin. primed myosin heads can no oops, longer bind to actin. No more tension. No more changed shape. And the muscle relaxes. And just that simply, we have put all the pieces together. Again, I want the information. I have no problem with you doing bullet points. You don't have to write it out as a story. You don't have to write it out as paragraphs. The only thing I caution you about is sometimes when people do bullet points, they tend to be brief, like it's an outline. I don't want an outline. I want details. Don't just say that it opens a channel or closes a channel. Tell me what the channel is. And notice, as you look at this, every single time I did it, first I wrote it out the first time, and then I would abbreviate it after that, right? So make sure, or like I said, have a key up at the top or something like that. But yeah, this is what I'm looking for. This would be the perfect answer to essay question number seven. This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for specifics, and I'm looking for details, and I'm looking for step by step. Right, we close the calcium channels and we pump the calcium away. Then what was the implication of that? And so on and so forth. And that's all I want. Well, and taking a screenshot is fine, but I will remind you uh, that on an exam, you are supposed to write things in your own words. So just regurgitating this on a page isn't necessarily gonna be sufficient. I want you to write these in your own words. Right, describe this process. That's how you show me you own it. But yeah, look, as I've said many times, the reason I like this class is because this class is hard. I don't have to be tricky. I can tell you this is exactly what I'm looking for on an essay. I can tell you that two of those seven essay questions are guaranteed to be on your exam because I know you're gonna have to put a hell of a lot of work to memorize all that stuff. So what I love about this class, I don't have to be tricky. This class is hard because of the volume of information you're responsible for. My job is to make it clear. So I don't know how to make it any more clear than this. This is what I'm looking for. And notice to, again, beat the dead horse. As you can hopefully very clearly see, there's no new information here, right? Step two, essay questions two, starts here. And where does it end? If instead I asked you for termination of communication at the neuromuscular junction, you would start with the decision to relax and where would it end? When the motor end plate. Re uh... Gotta go a little further than the channels closing. Remember what's the goal of communication at the neuromuscular junction? No muscle action potential. Exactly. The goal is to make a muscle action potential. So when we stop, we are done. So notice if instead I asked you essay question two, that's essay question two. If instead I asked you essay question five, where does essay question five begin? Right, where essay question two ends. Exactly, remember, where one ends, the next begins because they are the continuous process. So essay question five begins with no muscle action potential spreading down the sarcolemma into the point where, right, prime myosin heads can no longer bind to the actin. And now you can see why we don't turn off contractile cycle, because once the myosin head stops binding, then that's done. 
<laughs> so again, that one sentence essay questions don't make good essay questions. So again, question seven, there's no new information on this. This is not new information. This is just two plus five together. Plus 10 plus 20. Nope. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. That took a little longer than I'd hoped, but I think it is important to take the time to do this. So we have one last break. Uh, let's make it a little bit of a shorter break. I still want to give you guys some time to rest, but we need to switch gears into the lab. So let's come back at 310. That's enough time to get a drink, go to the bathroom, cry, whatever it is you need to do. But let's come back at 310 and we will start there. And again, at this point, you want your red and blue pens. You want your handouts so we can work on our origins, insertions, and actions. All right. I will leave this up if you want to look at it during the break. I will see you guys back here in 10 minutes. So last class, we left off uh, talking about the uh, origins, insertions, and actions of the muscles associated with the head and neck. So we are now on to those involved in the movement of the trunk, the core of the body. And along with that, that also means the pectoral girdle. And that's one of the things we see indeed here with the trapezius. Uh, the trapezius, as you can see, it gets its name from its trapezoid shape. After all, if you think of it, again, it is a paired muscle. We have right two basically parallel lines here and then two converging lines uh, forming that trapezoid shape. And of course, if you put them together, it forms uh, basically this big, huge kite shape muscle located uh, superiorly uh, superficial and mostly posterior, right? Of course, what do I mean when I say the trapezius is a mostly posterior muscle? Some of it is anterior. Yeah, exactly. And I think the easiest way to see that is to look at its origin and its insertion. Of course, specifically its uh, insertion. So let's take a look at this. Let's make this bigger. If I do that, does that actually make it bigger on your screen? What I just did. Obviously, I know this will make it bigger. Excellent. So let's go ahead and draw our origin. What is the origin of the, let's do that and do that. What is the origin of the trapezius muscle? The occipital. Excellent. So it starts up here on that occipital bone at the occipital uh, uh, external occipital protuberance. What else? Um, the spines, uh, specifically this um, C1 through C7 and the thoracic vertebrae. Well, let's be careful. Definitely C7, right, or vertebral prominence, that prominent uh, spinous process that sticks out. And all of the thoracic, T1 through T12, but does it actually connect to the spinous processes of C1 through uh, C6? No. No, notice what it actually connects to. It doesn't connect directly to the muscle. Instead, oops, that's what I wanted. What I wanted was this. Instead, there is an elastic connective tissue ligament that helps to hold the head up and in place. And what is that ligament that it actually connects to? The ligamentum nuca. Nucha, nuca, absolutely right. This is the nuchal region of the neck. The back of the neck is the nuchal region. And so ligamentum nocha, which if you think about it makes sense. This is a big powerful muscle. We don't wanna necessarily attach it directly to the cervical vertebrae because we want the freedom of movement of our cervical vertebrae. So we need it stabilized, we need this muscle in place, but 
we don't want it connected directly to the bones of the cervical region because we want that freedom of motion and movement. Now, obviously, like we see, it's a big, broad origin. And we know origins tend to be big and broad. And clearly, this is all on the posterior side of the body. However, what is its insertion? A continuous insertion along a chromium spine of scapula and lateral third of clavicle. Excellent. Notice it starts here posteriorly on the spine of the scapula out to the acromium of the scapula, right? The spine is definitely posterior. I guess you could argue the acromium is maybe lateral, but it's still mostly posterior. But as you've pointed out, it also comes out onto the anterior lateral third of the clavicle. So a little bit of its insertion does actually come onto the anterior side of the body. And you may have never thought of it in these terms before, but if you think about it, especially when we got these big old husky bodybuilders, right? Notice when this muscle, get, this muscle gets nice and big and massive, we can actually see those little bit of it that actually comes here onto the anterior part of the body. So that big, huge neck muscle that we see is not actually the neck muscle, but is actually the trapezius coming up over the top, as we can see really nicely on our bodybuilder picture here. All right, so we can see that nice, big, prominent trapezius muscle, mostly on the back, but sneaking a little bit onto the anterior side. All right, questions on that? So again, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna cheat and draw this as a continuous line like that. Uh, draw this as a continuous line like this. Excellent, so we have that. All right, so questions? The, uh, Go ahead. Sorry, so the red line going down, that's the trapezius or is that the oct uh, octopistal um, bone? This is the origin of the trapezius. This is the insertion of the trapezius. So if you think about it, what the trapezius is, is a bunch of muscle fascicles, some of them coming down from the front, some of them coming straight across, some of them coming down from the bottom. It's this big, huge convergent. Remember we learned about those convergent muscles, this big, huge convergent muscle. And in fact, if we go back to the actual illustration, we can see that. Here is its origin, starting up at the occipital bone, all the way down thoracic vertebrae spinous processes. Here is its, or its insertion. And again, notice some of these fascicles are going to the front. And we have all these fascicles of this big, huge convergent muscle coming in together to form that trapezoid shape, which is the trapezius. Yes, Yulia. So how do we know when and where the trapezius ends and where the platysma? Um, for some reason, like it looks like from the book that platysma is like the side of the neck muscle. Uh, it's more of the anterior side of the neck. Um, so notice here, if we look at this, we can see this chart in your textbook does a nice job of showing it. This muscle here coming down from this this way, that is the platysma. Notice his shoulders down, so we can only see a little bit of it, but this is that tiny little bit of the trapezius that is coming over onto the top. So coming across over to the top. So the platysma is all right here and the trapezius is gonna be behind it. Okay. All right, questions on its origins and its insertions. And again, I will do this real quickly, real simply, just to emphasize the next point that I need to make. All right. Now, remember, one of the things that we have talked about with these convergent muscles is with all these fascicles at all these different orientations, it allows for a lot of flexibility of movement. 
And notice primarily what this is going to influence is influence the scapula, the shoulder blade. So back in ancient times, and in ancient times, I mean when I was in elementary school. When I was in elementary school, we learned about the three R's. Anybody know the three R's that I learned when I was back in elementary school? Anybody's grandfather or grandmother told them about the three R's that they learned way back in my day? No. <laughs> no, unfortunately, I'm way may, uh, too old for that. My children learned about reduce, reuse, and recycle. But back in my day, in ancient time, what were the three R's? Nobody knows? The three R's in my day were reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? Have you ever heard that before? Reading, writing, arithmetic, the three R's. Well, those were the three R's back in my day in elementary school. And if you think about it, two of those three R's aren't really R's, which tell you about <laughs> writing and arithmetic are not really ours. So it tells you something about uh, the education. Absolutely, right? So those are the three R's. You're right. It's gotten a little better uh, with my kids, reduce, reuse, and recycle. But here you get to learn the three R's of the trapezius. The trapezius has three R's on its effect of the scapula. What are the effects that our trapezius has on the scapula? Raise, rotate, and retract. There you go. Raise. Now remember, raise isn't the correct term for it. We want to use the appropriate anatomical term, which of course is going to be to elevate. But raise gives us an R. Retract, which means to bring it back towards the midline. So remember, we could also think of that as a deduction to bring it back that way. But the other thing that it does is it rotates it. Think of it this way. If we were to elevate our arm to the side, and of course, what would that action be called to elevate your arm to the side? Abduction. Abduction. Notice if you look at the bones, when we got to about here, as I tried to continue to go up, the neck of my humerus would bang against the acromion and the clavicle. One of the best ways you can experience this is with somebody else in your house. You can do it, you can feel it for yourself, but it's actually easier to do with somebody else. Grab somebody else in your household, put your hand on their scapula and have them abduct their arm all the way up. And what you'll feel on their scapula as their arm first starts to come up, the scapula doesn't move. But when it gets to about here, as they continue to go up, what'll happen is the scapula actually rotates. Oh, yikes. Yeah, banging against there. So as we abduct the arm, it is actually going to rotate the scapula. So raise, retract, abduct, and rotate the scapula are the three actions for the, uh, three of the four actions of the trapezius, but those are the three that it does for the scapula. Now, as we have talked about, using other muscles, I could stabilize my scapula so it doesn't move, so that if I just contracted the superior part of my trapezius, what would happen instead? Instead of my shoulder going up, what would happen instead? Well, what's the fourth action of the trapezius, folks? These are the easy questions because you should have them on the papers right in front of you. It extends the head. Extend the head. Instead of the shoulder going up, the head would go back. So there you go. Those are your four actions for the trapezius. Elevate the scapula, retract the scapula, rotate the scapula, extend the head. Now, I asked you last time to come up with activities that involve all of these motions. Did anybody come up with a good one? Anybody have one they want to share? Remember, as I mentioned, if you guys don't start working on this and sharing this, I will make this a graded assignment where I put you into groups and make you do this. Excellent. Daniel, can you demonstrate us what you mean by that? I think that's a good example. I like that example a lot. Bold enough to demonstrate for us. <laughs> All right. Well, at least get on, on mic and describe it for us.
Okay, so basic when you shoot a free throw, you're using a, you know a basketball, and you're a b ducting with one arm, yeah. whether it be supporting arm or not. Right. And then when you're when you actually shoot, um, if you are a good basketball player, you have legs and you get in the air a little bit, um, and you're extending. Okay, so. But but the one thing that doesn't do is you're not really bringing it back. You're not retracting it too much because you don't bring it back for that. So it's not a bad this one. I true. like that because most of it. The one that I always think of for this one would be, for instance, in tennis. If you're doing a tennis serve, think about a mm. tennis serve or throwing a football, Ariana, that'd be a good example. Volleyball serve is another great example. If you think about volleyball or volleyball is another great one. I like volleyball a lot. Right. If you're going to make that serve, what you do is you bring the arm back. So you're retracting it. Right. You're elevating it. You're bringing it up. You need to rotate the scapula so you have it up there. And then when you throw the ball up in the air, you have to look up to see it so that you're ready to take that swing. So getting ready for that tennis serve, whether you have the racket or that volleyball, where you're going to slap it with your hand or throwing a football. Right. And you're throwing that Hail Mary. So you're throwing it up high or something. Yeah. All of those are great examples of, of ways that you would do something like that. So those are, again, those three things. You're elevating it, you're retracting it, you're rotating it, and you're extending the head. All right. Excellent. All right. Where were we here? All right. So questions. Uh, yeah. Sydney, did you have a question? So if uh, something like the tennis serve was to show up on, let's say like a worksheet that we might have, would there be other muscles that you would want us to list that would also flex the head? So again, remember or when, I'm, when, when we are describing these things, if it has multiple actions, we want that activity to involve multi all of the actions. Otherwise it's not a good mnemonic, right? Uh, like I said, the basketball was not bad. There are definitely some, some parts that are involved in it, but it also involves some motions that aren't associated with the muscle and it didn't involve all the actions of the muscle. So it's not the best reminder. So the goal for this is to have, um, have an activity that involves all of the actions of a muscle. Now, is it possible that we have muscles that have identical actions? Yeah. Yes. So if we have muscles that have identical actions, could either of those work for a particular activity? Yes. Yes, absolutely. However, they would have to be identical actions. Otherwise, it would have to be a different activity. Uh, okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Excellent. All right. So again, we're back in the form. We understand how the game is played. Anything else on the trapezius before we move forward? All right. What's next on our list? Serratus anterior. Excellent. Serratus anterior. Serratus anterior, as the name would indicate, is a mostly anterior muscle. That is a deep muscle. Notice here when they've conveniently peeled away all of the superficial muscles, we can see where this one gets its name. Notice as you look at it, because of all of its attachments to the ribs, it gives it a kind of serrated or scalloped appearance, kind of like a serrated cutting knife, like that bread knife with that serrated or scalloped edge to it. All right, now here's where things get a little tricky is with their origin and insertion. So let's go here first for the serratus anterior. And I need to go back to this one for it. Ah, you know what? That's in the way. I'll just use, I don't know. These are all from, no, this one will work. Okay. I know this is the pectoralis minor, minor, but it's the same picture. So it's fine for this. All right. So what is the origin of the serratus anterior? Ribs one through eight. Excellent. So over here on the anterior surface of the ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight on the anterior surface, that is where it is. Now notice if we were to take a top down view, and that's why I wanted to use this picture here. Nope. Here is our thoracic cage 
for clarification, there is our vertebrae in the back. Notice the origin would be here on the anterior side of the ribs. Now, where is its insertion? Anterior surface of medial border of scapula. Scapula, absolutely. So notice back here and back here, we have the scapulas. And here we see the scapula right here. But listen to what she said when she described it. It is on the anterior medial border. So notice that means all the way back here medially, right here on the anterior side. Notice technically, I don't see that here. Now again, remember you are doing this for you. So however it works for you. What I usually do is I just draw a line on the most, anti uh, most medial part of the scapula I can find. But if you wanted with a pencil, you could actually draw back in back here in the back where that medial border would be. And then like with a highlighter or something like that, go ahead and draw it in or however it is that you wanted to do that. Or draw this picture here the way I've drawn it as well. Again, there is no wrong answer with this. That's basically the job of this is to help you to understand the material. So whatever helps you to understand the material is best. What I like about the top down view is then we see how this muscle starts on the anterior part of the ribs, wraps around the ribs and attaches to the anterior medial part of the scapula. And this view really helps us to understand what this muscle does. Because as we know, when a muscle contracts, that muscle pulls its insertion towards its origin. So notice what this does is pull the scapula against the back wall, stabilizing it in place against the ribs. Sometimes the nerve that innervates this muscle gets damaged. Uh, it's part of the brachial plexus in the shoulder. So a twisting or crushing blow, you fall down on your shoulder or something like this, this nerve can get injured. And what'll happen is your scapulas will start to peel off the back of your uh, body where it'll start to stick out straight uh, to the back. It's what they actually call a winging of the scapula when the scapula points backwards like that. Right, that is a bad thing. Obviously, that is going to affect the range of motion of your shoulder and things along those lines when that occurs. But notice it can't truly pull it all the way forward because those pesky ribs are in the way. So notice as it's stabilizing the scapula and holding it against the ribs, the other thing it's doing is pulling it forward. And of course, pulling it forward, we call a protraction. But to get forward, it has to come to the side. And notice as it comes to the side, it's moving away from the midline. So that would be an AB duction. So either of those two are acceptable ways of describing it. Uh, AB duction or a protraction, either of those are acceptable for the bringing of that forward, stabilizing it in place. All right. One more point I want to make about this muscle. Notice as we go back to the illustration, most of the heads of the serratus anterior are deep. So notice to see them, we had to peel the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor and some of the other muscles out of the way. However, most isn't all. Notice there are a few of the heads that actually stick out underneath the pectoralis major. And you can see the little heads pecking out like that on our model. Of course, it doesn't look like that in real life, does it? Yeah. Well, here again, our chart shows it. But again, when you put skin on top of this, you can't see that, can you? Yeah, you can. Yeah, absolutely you can. 
Absolutely you can. Right there, you see those heads of the serratus anterior coming out from underneath the pectoralis major uh, in that pose. So absolutely you can see these. So most of the heads are super are deep, but uh, you can see it superficially, uh, uh, the inferior part superficially as well. All right. Yes. It's also easier to see on like a darker skin tone, whether or whether you put like a spray tan or something before competitions, or if you just have naturally darker like skin color, it makes it easier to see. Yeah, you get more contrast. Absolutely. So you're absolutely right. So um, many of the bodybuilders will indeed use straight spray tanning to artificially color their skin because so that you get more contrast. Absolutely. Yeah, it's why the bodybuilders use bronzer. It's why they also dehydrate dehydrate themselves right before a, uh, a, a competition is because with the body dehydrated, the skin uh, attaches more uh, tightly to the muscles underneath. And so again, makes the muscles stand out much more prominently as well. Yep, best way to do that is to take a bunch of salt. Well, okay, I would argue with your term best because I wouldn't, uh, it's like quickest. Quickest I'll be, I agree with, you know, I, I, I was not a bodybuilder at any point in my life, but uh, in high school and my first year of college, I did wrestle. And one of the big things in wrestling is absolutely all about losing weight. And uh, one of the most effective ways uh, to lose weight uh, is to lose water weight. And so uh, I, myself and many, many of the other wrestlers would often practice wearing garbage bags. So basically you wear a garbage bag while you were wrestling, while you were running and doing things like that, because again, it held all the heat in and made you sweat. And absolutely, it was a great way to lose weight very, very quickly, but it is absolutely positively not healthy for you either. All right, so yeah, so again, I would, I would say that it is a fast way to do it, but it isn't necessarily a healthy way to do it. Uh, we're supposed to draw the insertions and origins for the serratus anterior model or the pectoralis minor. Uh, no, so uh, obviously you were supposed to draw it where it says serratus anterior, but if you notice, it was basically the same picture. So it was just because I enlarging the screen and because of where I have the cameras and all of that, it was just more convenient for me that way to use that. So obviously draw them where you're supposed to so that you have that. Absolutely, right? It's all, again, as we've talked about many, many times, doesn't matter what you do to the inside of your body. It's only the outside of your body that matters, right? It's only the outside of your body that matters. So who cares if you die of heart disease or a failed heart or all those other things, as long as you get that plastic trophy. Liver. All that matters. All right, excellent. Yeah, liver, liver, great example. All right, spectacular. But again, not saying that this person is doing anything wrong either in how they're training, but the point is, uh, and again, as I mentioned, one of the awesome things about these bodybuilders is that uh, we get tremendous great definition. So absolutely, uh, we get to uh, use that to our advantage to be able to identify muscles, superficial muscles in that way. Absolutely. Um, again, I'm not collecting your handouts. This is your study guide to help you to be successful. But is it possible that I could show you a picture of a scapula on the exam, right on the exam, there could be a picture of a scapula. And could I have an arrow pointing to the anterior medial border of the scapula? And could I ask you to identify the muscle that inserts into that bone feature? Absolutely. Right? I guaranteed you that uh, somewhere between 15 and 20% of this exam is going to be bones that you are gonna be responsible for identifying muscles based solely on their origins and insertions. That's why we take the time to draw them. And again, as we've also emphasized the, and again, it's gone, cause again, they're not there when I point it, when I do it, but drawing these origins insertions, like we did drawing that circle, drawing that scapula, seeing where the origin is, seeing where the insertion is helps us to understand how the muscle functions. Because again, as we know, when a muscle contracts, the insertion is pulled towards the origin. So as we can see, there are basically two functions 
of the serratus anterior. It stabilizes the scapula holding against the wall of the ribs and it protracts, or you can use the term a uh, B ducts it because it brings it away from the midline. Right? So again, the other advantage of drawing these things is to help us to understand their actions. So that's why I think it's a worthwhile thing to do. All right, what's next? Um... Rhomboids. Rhomboids, excellent. Okay, perfect. Rhomboids is a muscle group. Notice again, it is comprised of the rhomboid major and the rhomboid minor, but again, those names aren't on your list. We don't care about those. I just want you to know them collectively as a group that is the rhomboids. Again, named for their shape, absolutely. All right. uh, and let's go ahead and draw those. They can fit this in here. What is their origin? Spinous process of C7 and T5. Excellent. So again, C7, T1, T2, T3, T4, and T5. And again, I am perfectly fine with you saying the spinous processes of C7 through T5. You don't have to write out all of them, T1, T2, T3, T4, saying that is fine. Of course, you definitely need to say spinous process, right? But saying the spinous process of C7 through T5 is totally acceptable for this, absolutely. And what is the insertion? Posterior uh, medial border of scapula. Excellent. Notice that same medial border of the scapula but this time on the posterior side. So notice if we go ahead and draw that, let's do it in black. If we draw that rib cage, if we draw that scapula, notice, and I'll do it in, let's do it this way, dark. Here is the insertion for, oops, the serratus anterior and the origin for the serratus anterior. So let's connect those two. And then, oops, I forgot to put my vertebrae here with its spinous process so that I can do in pink my origin and in light blue my insertion and then in light green, connect the two. So notice the serratus anterior connects to the anterior medial border. The rhomboid connects to the posterior medial border. The serratus anterior brings the scapula forward, or you can think of it as outward. So which way does our uh, rhomboids bring our scapula. Immediately. Yeah, it brings it immediately, which would be an adduction, or again, my drawing's not the best here. It brings it posteriorly, which would be a retraction. So retracts or adducts. And again, if you right retract both of them at the same time, you can feel the muscles bundling up in the middle, you can feel those rhomboids bundling up in the middle when you are doing that back. So bringing that back, absolutely. And again, like I said, remember we talked about shape of the muscles, action of the muscles, location of the muscles. Those are the three main ways that we name our muscles. So absolutely, rhomboids or trapezius is a trapezoid shape. Rhomboids are rhomboid shape muscles. So absolutely. So there you go. Notice this is a deep muscle. So we have to peel the trapezius off to be able to see it underneath that. And so again, we look at our model. Here, the trapezius, when it's in place, we can't see it. But when you peel the trapezius off, you see the rhomboids. So we've done the serratus anterior and the rhomboids. We can see they're related to each other. Did anybody come up with anything clever to help us to remember what they do? I don't know if um, I'm right, though. Okay, well, just throw it out there. Let's find out. 
Um, so for the serratus anterior, I kind of thought of like maybe putting on deodorant. So you're like. Absolutely. Reaching across that way. Absolutely. Especially if you do them both at the same time. I like that. That's perfect. And for the rhomboids, um, uh, the chest bump. Yep. There you go. Absolutely. I like that. Chest bump. I don't know what the Spider-Man plank is. What is a Spider-Man plank? Are you going to demonstrate it for us, Ariana? <laughs> you want to demonstrate the Spider-Man plank? <laughs> no, what's a Spider-Man plank? You know how like where you're, it's like you're laying on your, your whole stomach and then you kind of like get your hands behind your back and you kind of lift yourself up a little bit? Oh, is that what that's called? I don't <laughs> No, I, I I look, I, you, look, you've seen me. I clearly don't, don't have the body of someone who works out regularly. I hadn't heard of that before. I like that. Okay, so you're doing that arch with your arms behind you. All right, excellent. Or Superman, something like that. <laughs> there I don't you know go. Why it's <laughs> excellent. So, again, superhero plank, something like that. Excellent. All right, that's spectacular. I like that. And again, the one I always think, well, not always, but now because we're in COVID, here's what I always think of too. The other thing that the serratus anterior is really good for is hugging someone. Right? Again, you're bringing the scapulas forward. If you're hugging someone, you can feel your scapula. So again, hopefully a couple months from now, you're gonna be out and about, see some friend you haven't seen in a year and a half, and you're gonna go up and give them a big hug. Oh, Bob, I've missed you so much, right? And then you remember that Bob owes you 50 bucks, right? He borrowed 50 bucks from you before this whole COVID thing and he never paid you back. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna bring that arm back to punch him in the face, All right? So use the rhomboids to bring it back and the serratus end here to hug it. All right, so there you go. All right, excellent. So that is that. What's next? The pectoralis minor. Pectoralis minor, excellent. All right, pectoralis minor is a deep muscle. And as we'll see from its origin insertion, it is a muscle that affects the trunk. The pectoralis major, as we know, moves the arm. So it is an arm muscle, but the pectoralis minor is actually a trunk muscle. And I think we see that best when we look at its origin and insertion. So let's do that. What is the origin of the pectoralis minor? The anterior surface of ribs three to five. Excellent. So one, two, three, four, and five, excellent. So we have that nice anterior and kind of inferior origin. And what is its insertion? Coronoid process of scapula. Careful, coracoid, right? Coracoid, remember, means bird's beak. That bird's beak that sticks out, that is that coracoid process of the scapula. That is its insertion. Again, notice muscles pull their insertions towards their origins. So I'll use the inappropriate terms for this and you can tell me the correct ones. When we look at its actions, it is gonna bring the shoulder down, but what of course would the appropriate term for that be? Depress. Depress the scapula, excellent, right? It is going to bring the scapula forward or wrap it around the ribs. So what would that be? Protract. Protract or AD, abduction, right? Where it's pulling it away. However, if I want, I can use other muscles like my trapezius to hold my shoulder in place. So that when I contract the pectoralis minor, instead of the shoulder coming down, the ribs come up, right? So I can stabilize it so that basically the origin and insertion reverse and the ribs come up. So those are my three actions. Depress the scapula, protract the scapula and elevate the ribs. All right. Did anybody come up with anything good for this one? Probably like elbowing a minor or something. <laughs> elbowing a minor. Oh, I like that because you got to go down and, and bring it across. Absolutely. That doesn't quite get the. Yeah, uh, the, and it has the word minor in it. That doesn't get the chest quite into it as well, but definitely someone's small who's down there. I like that. I like that a lot. That's a good one. 
Yeah, it's tough. This one, this one is a little bit challenging. Uh, I, I don't quite fully understand this one myself. My sister tells me she uses these muscles all the time to get out of speeding tickets. But I pulled over, I got pulled over the other day and I depressed my scapulas, I protracted them and I elevated my rib cage and I still got the ticket. So I'm not okay. sure exactly how that works, but she says she uses it to get out of tickets. So I don't know, there you go. What about bench pressing? Would that be an example? Uh, so the problem with- like flexing your pecs, your pecs, right? Yeah, that's more, yeah, exactly. The bench press is gonna be more the pectoralis major and not so much the pectoralis. Mm, okay. Right. So yeah. So again, we don't want. We don't want. It. So this one's just about bringing it down, bringing it forward, bringing the ribs up. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure chopping wood because again, those are kind of more coming. To, you know, those are more things involving the arm. We don't want to involve the arm. It's just about the shoulder. What about lifting up groceries? Hmm. Lifting up groceries, like a bunch of groceries, kind of. You know? Sure. I like that. Oh, there you go. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So you got to lift them up to balance it. I like that. What bringing about the arms down. What? What about pouting? Like when people get all offended, not like pouting in the face, but like getting all tense when someone yeah, brings exactly right. You, you you puff out the chest, absolutely. Exactly. When someone brings up Biden and you happen to be not into him. There you go. That can work, right? Or you're trying to get more follows on TikTok. So this is a good one for that as well. Absolutely. Like I said, my sister uses it to get out of speeding tickets. So all of those are uh, are good examples of things that you could use this one for. All right, excellent. All right, spectacular. What's next? The diaphragm. Excellent. Notice just that quickly, we are out of all the muscles that we need to know origins and insertions for, for the trunk. All right, I think that's it for that list. Let's cheat and take a peek. Do I have my list as well? Oops, back here. Yeah, there you go. That's it. Those are the only muscles we need to know the origins and the insertions for. That doesn't mean that there isn't still a whole lot going on with the trunk, but those are the ones that we need to know the origins and insertions for. So for the rest of these, remember, we don't need to know origins and insertions, but we need do need to understand their actions. Let's start with the diaphragm. Here, we see the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a muscle we've talked about since the very beginning of the class. Here we are looking at it from an inferior view. So from the abdominal pelvic cavity, we're looking up at the ribs and notice we can't see into the thoracic cavity because there's this nice bell-shaped muscle that remember we talked about is that anatomical barrier between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. Notice it's got a couple holes in it so that the aorta, the inferior vena cava, the esophagus and things like that can travel between them. But the most part, it's a pretty important boundary. And it's a curved bell-shaped muscle. This is important when we look at the anatomy of it because as we talked about, it forms that boundary between the thoracic cavity. Wow, that's horrible. Between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, as we know, when muscles contract, typically they get shorter. And when a curved muscle like this gets shorter, what happens to it? It. Smaller range of motion. Decrease down. Yeah, it flattens out. When a curved thing contracts, basically what happens is it flattens out. So when this muscle contracts, basically it flattens out. So when the diaphragm contracts, which of course we know is the active where it's using the ATP, right? Basically it flattens out. This is significant because when that occurs, it is gonna change the volume of the thoracic cavity. And how does it change the volume? Increases. It increases the volume. Increases the volume in the thoracic cavity. And as we know, when volume changes, pressure changes. So if volume increases, what happens to the pressure in the thoracic cavity? 
decrease. Decreases pressure. And as we know, pressure is what makes the world go round. When the pressure decreases in the thoracic cavity, what wants to flow into that area to fill up that, uh, to go to that low pressure environment? Oxygen. Yeah, well, not just oxygen, but you get the right idea. Air. Air enters the lungs. Right? Essentially, this is how we inhale. Inhaling is an active process where we are contracting the muscle using ATP. And when we use that ATP, we increase the volume, decrease the pressure, and air comes into our lungs. Conversely, when we relax the muscle, it's gonna go back up into its curved shape. When it goes back to its curved shape, what happens to the volume of our thoracic cavity? Decreases. And when the volume decreases, what happens to pressure? Increases. And when that happens, our air exits the lungs. And that is our exhale, all right? Notice this is actually a passive process. This is what occurs when the diaphragm relaxes. We're not using ATP. Instead, basically what's happening is the muscle is just recoiling. Remember, it has elasticity. It's gonna go back to its original shape. So that elasticity allows it to go back to its original shape and we breathe out. Yes, to be true. So even though we can, we, we voluntarily breathe in and breathe out, this isn't like, it is an eventually ending cycle, but never ending cycle to say, um, we, it's still considered voluntary be, because even though, I mean, you can't really not breathe. I guess. Okay. I, I, I totally, I totally get the question you're answering and I, I totally understand what you're trying to say. Absolutely. These are skeletal muscles. Okay. So these are things that you absolutely control, right? If I told you right now to inhale, hold it for a count of three, and then let it out in three short exhalations, you could definitely do that, right? These are voluntary muscles that you control. But so are your eyelids, right? Open your eyes, close your eyes. Open your eyes, close your eyes. I can do that as well. You can do that as well. We can all do that. But Thankfully, these types of muscles are also controlled by reflexes. So I don't have to sit here thinking, all right, breathe in, relax the diaphragm so I can breathe out. Breathe in, oh wait, hold on, I gotta contract my muscles and my eyes to blink, right? We don't have to do all of that because there are reflexes that control them. So blinking, breathing, all of those normal basal processes are controlled by reflexes that are controlling the rates of them. But they are skeletal muscles that we can voluntarily control. So if I wanna close my eyes and keep my eyes closed, I can do that. If I wanna hold my breath and count to 10, I can do that. We have that ability to voluntarily control it. And notice even this, while you're sitting there calmly in your chair, this is how you're breathing, right? You are actively contracting your diaphragm to bring air in and then relaxing the diaphragm to bring the air back out. However, if you have to talk like I'm doing, or if you have to blow out some birthday candles, can we contract muscles to actively exhale? Absolutely. Now, none of you are probably sitting right now in your chairs going, right? That's not how we normally breathe while you're sitting there, right? Your normal, what we call resting or tidal breathing basically just uses the diaphragm relaxing and contracting. So it is, yeah, and that's part of the problem, right? Absolutely, we have accessory muscles that if we get the wind knocked out of you, if activity of the diaphragm just gets disrupted, we don't die as a result of it. You may feel like you're going to, but you don't die as a result of it because we do have other muscles that can help in that process. In fact, we've already talked about some. If you think about it, the pectoralis minor, 
the sternocleidomastoid, the scalenes, all of those are muscles that help us to enhance our inhalation. And we'll also get to some muscles. Well, we actually we already talked about one. We didn't talk about it, but our serratus anterior. Our serratus anterior, when it squeezes the scapula against the ribs, <sighs> helps us to blow out that air as well. So yeah, and absolutely, me right now speaking, I have to actually manually control those muscles, manually control the rate at which the air is coming out so I can produce speech. All right. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, absolutely correct. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, automatic car is a great way of getting rid of it. Yeah, and again, you don't have to think about blinking, but you can control it. You can change it if you wanted to. So notice, diaphragm is really responsible for all normal resting breathing. But when we think of terms of what it is actively doing when the muscle contracts, it's flattening, it is increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity, it is causing that inhalation to occur. All right, questions on that? How are we on time? I think, let me look at my list. I'm, I'm curious, how big is the diaphragm muscle? Well, let's do that, okay. Um, like I always imagined it to be a super tiny, thin membrane, but it looks a lot bigger from that picture. Yeah, notice basically it, Again, it has to form that boundary between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. So basically it connects, at, you don't need to know its origins and its insertions, but notice it basically connects to the entire uh, thoracic cavity from the xiphoid process all the way around the ribs, all the way to the back to the vertebrae. Otherwise it can't form that physical barrier that has to separate the uh, thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. So it's as big as we are around? More so, because remember, it's curved inside of there. OK. So think of it, if you think about it, if you cut it and laid it out flat, it would be wider than your R wide, wider than your rib cage. So yeah, it's a good size muscle. I'm going to give you one more, and then we'll hit a stopping point. And it involves this diaphragm. The diaphragm, as we talked about, is this barrier between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. But technically, we do have a second diaphragm. That second diaphragm is what is known as the urogenital diaphragm. Here we see that in a female, and here we see that in a male. The urogenital diaphragms, as you can see here, its job is to help to support the anus, support uh, urination and defecation, help to hold all of those organs of the pelvis up and in. Again, I know females don't have to deal with this, but most males have had to deal with this. Uh, if they did any kind of sports in high school or elementary school, you had to go and get a physical. And one of the things they did during a physical is you had to turn your head and cough, right? While the doctor uh, copped a feel. Now, again, it wasn't so much that the doctor could cop a feel, though I'm sure he enjoyed it, but it's also basically what he was looking for is sports hernias weakness in this urogenital diaphragm that he was looking for. Now, if you'll notice, the primary muscle, again, both here in males and here in females, that forms that bottom wall, that muscular wall of the bottom of the urogenital diaphragm is a muscle group known as the levator ani muscle. Again, here we see it in females and here we see it in males. Notice there are two muscles that make up the muscle group levator ani, pubococcygeal and the iliococcygeus. Now, while those are incredibly fun to say, do you actually have to know them? No. No, you just need to know them collectively as the levator ani muscle. And like I said, its job is to provide support. When we defecate, you elevate your levator ani to help in the defecation process. 
right? If you were uh, urinating and you wanted to stop midstream, that contraction you would make is that contraction of the levator ani muscle, which would stop the urine flow midstream. And something that the boys here don't have to worry about, but the women here do, women get the honor and privilege of passing a basketball through the vaginal canal. As such, when you pass a basketball through this urogenital diaphragm, not surprisingly, it can weaken these muscles. All right. Females not, may not think of it in those terms, but many women who have had babies are aware of this because shortly after you have babies, if you sneeze or if you cough or even if you laugh a little too hard, what can happen? You can pee your pants. Yeah, a little pee can come out, absolutely, right? Because of the weakness of that muscle stopping the urine flow from coming out. In extreme cases, if this wall weakens too much, you can actually have a prolapsing of the urogenital diaphragm, where I mean of the of the vaginal canal, where the vaginal canal will actually distend out of the urogenital diaphragm, what we call a prolapse, and then has to actually be surgically put back into place. <laughs> there you go, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So that's uh, the, absolutely, that is the case. So one of the things that women when they're pregnant are encouraged to do is to do an exercise that is gonna strengthen this levator ani muscle. And what is that exercise to strengthen the levator ani muscle? Kegel exercises, absolutely. Kegel exercises are when you contract that urogenital diaphragm. Again, think of it in terms of that contraction you would take to stop a urine flow while it's going out. You contract it, you hold it for a count of 10, you relax it, right? You do it in sets of about 10 or so. I've done three of them while I was standing here right now. Absolutely, right? So I'm sure a couple of you did them as well. And uh, again, that is those Kegel exercises and that helps to strengthen that wall for that. Laura, you had a question. Yeah, you said um, that um, it will, it tends to, or they're about prolapse. Does that also like tie in with preeclampsia or is that something completely different? No, something completely different. Preeclampsia has to do with uh, 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 high blood pressure associated with pregnancy and the stress of that. No, in this case, all we're talking about is if this wall becomes weakened, the vaginal canal itself can actually, so if you think about the urogenital diaphragm basically helps to hold everything in place. And what'll happen is the vaginal canal can actually descend and stick out past the uh, levator anide, past the urogenital diaphragm. And so then actually has to be surgically put back into place, has to be put back up and anchored in place and sewn in there. But again, strengthening those walls by doing things like Kegel exercises or something. And again, prolapsing of the vaginal canal is something that rarely happens. And especially if a female is doing the Kegel exercise like she's supposed to, is very unlikely to occur. So yes, by all means, I don't feel too scared to have kids, but, uh, but you know, it's also good to do your Kegel exercises as well. So we have both the diaphragm and the urogenital diaphragm that are basically the roof and the basement or the roof and the, and the floor of our abdominal pelvic cavity. So we have these two diaphragms. The diaphragm forms the roof, the urogenital diaphragm, primarily the vader ani muscle forms the floor. Is the lower one, is that referred to like the pelvic floor? I've heard people talk like recently about doing, seeing like a pelvic floor specialist after giving birth. Yes, so the pelvic floor would be, it would include the urogenital diaphragm. The urogenital diaphragm are the muscles that are in place here, but um, there are also connective tissues that are in place here. Uh, there can be tearing that occurs to the uh, vaginal wall. Uh, sometimes instead to, to control the tearing, they will actually put an incision in there to help in the expulsion of the baby. So, uh, so yes, uh, it can include the muscles, but it also can include other components as well. Thank you. Yep, yep. Again, the honor and privilege of passing that basketball. We appreciate it. All right. And again, 
Boys don't have to pass basketballs, but they have levator and eye muscles as well. And those Kegel exercises can be good for the boys as well. Kegel exercises can actually help to um, prolong, uh, uh, it's a good way to put it. I'll help you maintain an erection for longer. There you go, I won't pussyfoot around. So it can help to, uh, to help you prolong, uh, maintain an erection for a prolonged period of time. So again, it's good for the boys and it's good for the girls. Everyone should do Kegel exercises. There you go, excellent. Add it to your workout routine. Or just do it while you're sitting in class. That's the beauty of it. No one knows you're doing it. All right. Good for him. Tell him he's, I, I bet you, I guarantee he's done at least three of them since I started mentioning them. All right, excellent. Any other questions on any of that? All right. Where we need to go next are the intercostals and the abdominals. And in many ways, they're a group package. So I think it's best to save those to do together in the next class. How are we in time? We have three more classes. Yeah, we can make this work. We'll make that work. All right, excellent. So this is a good stopping point. We will go ahead and stop here rather than going any further. Uh, so this is where we will end for today. Uh, we'll have a little less lecture, I think, on the next one. Uh, so we'll have a little bit more time to catch up on our lab. So that should work. All right, so any questions on anything before we finish up for the day? All right, the last thing I wanna remind you is that again, yeah, thank you. Um, if you have not done so already, please go and sign up for a five for five so that I can meet with you so we can talk about what you're being successful with, uh, what we can do to improve, what you can do to improve, uh, and again, um, one, one, as I've said many times, one of the things I love about this class is that this class is challenging. And because of that, as an instructor, it allows me to be very straightforward. And I love that. I don't have to be tricky. I don't have to, uh, I actually, as soon as I'm done talking, I'll release the exams right now. Um, I don't have to be tricky. I can be very obvious because I know the time and effort. I like that because I don't have to be tricky and I don't have to worry about the process getting in the way. And that's the problem that's being online. Online, it's all about the process. This is a challenge. It's not intuitive way of handling this. I fully understand and appreciate it. And unfortunately, it's the way we have to do it. So again, I think taking a chance to check in at this point and talk about the things that have been successful for you and the things that haven't been successful for you uh, are ways that we can definitely improve. There are no more surprises in this class. You know exactly how I'm gonna ask the questions. You know exactly how I'm gonna ask the lab exam questions. You know exactly what I'm looking for on the grading of these things. So again, now the goal is to just get comfortable in you know, figuring out how to give me what it is that I want. And so I want to help you to be able to do that. So if you have not done so already, please, I encourage you to sign up to do that uh, so that, and again, I've, I've, I've given you that little carrot to encourage you to do that. Uh, but honestly, spending five minutes talking to me will hopefully help you far more than the five points you're going to get for doing it. All right. All right. Questions on any of that? All right. Have a good evening and I will see you guys on Thursday.